Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. If I could ask uh, people to take their seats. Good morning. There's a bit of hubbub over on this side of the room. We could just, uh... there we go. That's much better. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I formally call the meeting to order, Before I uh, formally call the meeting to order, I would just like to, uh, to say a few words uh, about uh, today in history. Today is a very important day in history, and I mentioned this in just talking to the media a few moments ago. On April the 9th, 2019, we observed the 102nd anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. 102 years ago, in unbelievable circumstances, and those uh, who have been fortunate as I have been to go to the site and actually hear the tour, um, get a really realistic idea of what the men and women representing Canada and as part of the Allied forces experienced uh, when uh, they uh, fought their way up the ridge to take the high ground uh, overlooking a plain there, the site of uh, what is today the very beautiful and moving uh, Vimy Memorial. By April the 12th, the Canadians had taken all of their objectives as well as 4,000 prisoners and the Canadians held Vimy Ridge and this was a very important moment uh, not only in the war, the First World War, but also a very important moment in Canadian history. But it came uh, at a terrible toll uh, when it came to, and it's almost unbelievable numbers uh, for any single day, because today, April the 9th, was not the end of the battle. It happened on the 12th. But today was the day of the, of the greatest uh, toll that's ever been taken in Canadian mil military history. 3,598 Canadians lost their lives, and 7,000 were wounded uh, during the four-day battle. And this was the worst of all of those days, April the 9th, 102 uh, years ago. And so in recognition, uh, of that sacrifice and of the incredible importance of this day uh, in the history of the world, let alone the history of Canada. Uh, we have uh, lowered the flags to half-staff here at City Hall, at Metro Hall, and at the civic centres across the city. Uh, and I would ask now that we take uh, a moment of silence to recognize the sacrifice that was made and to uh, remember uh, the people who fought for us that day. Thank you very much. So we have, uh, ladies and gentlemen, quorum, and uh, I will call the fourth meeting of the Executive Committee uh, to order. Uh, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on as the tr traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse, uh, diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And we also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I would remind people who are not with us, uh, or people who are and have to leave, uh, that uh, they're able to watch us on YouTube at Toronto City Council Live, or follow the meeting on your computer, tablet, or smartphone at www.toronto.ca backslash council. I will now call for any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Uh, if so, please indicate the item number and the nature of the interest. Are there any interests to be declared? Okay. Uh, may I have a motion to confirm the minutes of the Executive Committee meeting held on March 21st, 2019? Moved by the Deputy Mayor. Uh, all those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Uh, we have seven items on the agenda today, so let's proceed with the uh, rundown. Um, there we are. I am holding, uh, because there are deputations, um, with registered speakers, the first three items, uh, item EX 4.1, Toronto's Transit Expansion Program, update and next steps, there are deputations. Item number... EX 4.2, the future of King Street, results of the transit pilot, that is being held for deputations. Uh, item EX 4.3, uh, accelerating the city city's tenants' first project, uh, this is being held as well uh, for deputations. Uh, item EX 4.4. Uh, do I have a motion to accept the recommendation, uh, to re which is to receive the report? Moved by Councillor Ainsley. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Uh, item EX 4.5, remuneration of 
uh, remuneration and expenses of members of council and of council appointees to agencies, corporations, and other bodies for the year ended December 31st, 2018. And do I have a uh, motion to adopt the recommendation to receive the report? Or moved by the Deputy Mayor. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Item uh, 4.6. I think this is the one on which there's a motion, yeah. uh, and I think it, 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 there's nobody um, uh, there's nobody uh, deputing on this, and so I would uh, move that we forward the item to City Council without recommendation and request the Chief Financial Officer to report directly to City Council on this matter. Uh, anybody wish to? Uh, everybody, I'll, I'll, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, item uh, EX 4.7. Uh, annual report on the city's loans and loan guarantee portfolios. The disposition that's suggested is to adopt the recommendations in the report. Uh, do I have a motion from uh, the budget chief, Councillor Crawford? Uh, all those in favour? Opposed? Carried. And uh, so I think that brings us to uh, a procedural matter that I would like to deal with with the concurrence of the, uh, of the um, committee. Uh, we have a very large number of people wishing to speak with us today, which is a sign of uh, good health uh, of our democratic process, uh, but it's such that uh, I think it's appropriate to move a motion uh, that uh, speakers who have not pre-registered be allowed to register to speak until 10.30 today, after which there would be no further registration uh, al uh, allowed, and the list will be closed, that the length of public presentations be limited to three minutes, that questions of speakers by members of council, including members of the executive committee, be limited to three minutes with one round of questions per member, that questions to staff from members of council, including members of the executive committee, be limited to three minutes in total with one round of questions per member, and finally, that speaking times for all members of council be three minutes with one round of speaking uh, per member. And I think this means everybody's being treated uh, in the same manner, those who are members of council and those who are not. Um, and I think it just allows us to get through uh, all of uh, what we need to get through today to listen to everybody. Uh, so uh, are there any, uh, anybody wishing to speak to, to this motion? All right, I'll call the question then. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Okay, um, so uh, if you haven't registered, I would urge you before 10.30 obviously to register because we are going to cut the list off at that time just so we can manage uh, getting through everything that we need to get through. And uh, on that note, we can move to, uh, where's the green sheet? There it is. We can move to item EX 4.1, Toronto's Transit Expansion Program Update and Next Steps and go to the uh, deputations, uh, which we'll hear first, followed by uh, questions to, st to staff. And I think, are we going to have a brief presentation on that? A brief presentation uh, by the staff. Um, I just wonder whether we should have that first and then have the deputies. I think that's normally how we do this. So why don't you, uh, Mr. City Manager and your team, uh, do the presentation and then we'll go to the deputations so they can have a chance to see uh, the presentation. We're ready. So first off, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, members of executive and councillors that are joining us today. Um, what I'm going to do over the next 15 to 20 minutes is to run through a number of slides that basically sum up our 159-page document, which uh, focuses on Toronto's transit expansion program. So we like to refer to this as the omnibus transit report because it pulls together all the critical work that we've been doing over the last many years as per your direction. Next slide. So, of course, this is a comprehensive review of the status of our transit expansion program. It uh, as well speaks to the matter of PTIF 2 funding, uh, which we are now uh, beginning to have conversations with the province of Ontario, be working with the government of Canada to secure. Um, we are seeking authority to advance specific, uh, specific projects in the next phase of work to continue progress in building this network, and as well as we're going to be identifying key issues requiring further discussion with provincial and federal partners. 
And the report, as I say, uh, the main report uh, really focuses on two basic things. First, the transit network program overview, uh, and then secondly, the, uh, the PTIF 2 funding phase and what we're recommending regarding to that. And then of course, there are five attachments with specifying detail uh, projects uh, related to the PTIF 2 program. Next slide. So this picture uh, summarizes uh, all the projects that are part of Toronto's transit expansion program. Uh, this was a program that was approved back in 2016. It uh, gives you a very uh, clear understanding of the expanse or the extent to which we are uh, planning, designing, as well as building transit in Toronto. Uh, so with that, what we're going to do right now is kind of break down for you uh, the projects that uh, this map represents. So with that though, I want to just pause for a second and uh, the status of transit expansion projects and something I think that's really important. And this slide I know has got a lot of detail, but this slide really summarizes where all 15 projects are at uh, in terms of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a planning to construction process. So if you look at uh, the, the beginning of this process, which is that bar that's in deep red, um, that's where an idea of a transit project is, is created. So whether it's a problem that we're trying to resolve or an opportunity we're trying to take advantage of, that's your very first stage, all the way to the point in which the project has been procured and is built and is ready to be, uh, ready to be um, put into operation. So we've been talking, I know, from uh, the last several meetings about uh, stage gating. We, we talk in terms of uh, each step along the way, as well as we talk about uh, uh, the funding uh, estimates that we have uh, when a project is moving through this continuum. So that's really what this slide is all about. So I'm not going to drill down into the specifics of uh, the projects, but only to say that if you want to have one picture hang up in your office as to where we are at this moment in time in terms of transit investment, design and construction, that this slide, I think, will provide you as good an example of where everything is at. So with that, if we can move on to the... So line two extension, this project, uh, first of all, it's a 6.2 kilometer extension of line two from Kennedy Station to Scarborough Centre. Uh, important to note that it replaces the aging line three Scarborough and supports development Scarborough Centre. Um, I think you've heard from us uh, in recent past that uh, the... Um, uh, the aging Line 3 uh, transit is, is nearing its, uh, its useful life. Uh, I think we've talked about uh, 2026 as being the point in which that uh, is critical in terms of uh, uh, trying to have something uh, advanced as quick as we can to replace the service that's out there right now. The asset itself is owned by TTC. Uh, our planning, design and engineering phase is complete, so we're ready to move to procurement. Um, this has a capital cost estimate of $3.887 billion. We call this a class three, which means there is a considerable amount of detailed design or preliminary design that backs up this estimate. So it should give you a reasonable amount of confidence uh, given the stage that we're at. So that's the, the first of the program I want to point to. The second is the smart track stations again. Um, and I'll get into the funding commitments uh, later on in the presentation, but simply to point out that it's six new stations on the Stouffville Lakeshore East and Kitchener Go corridors. We're looking to see 10 minute, uh, six to 10 minute service at peak hours with fair integration. Um, of course, we want to uh, leverage the provincial investment in the Go expansion program. The owner of this line, uh, as you know, is Metrolinx. Uh, we uh, achieved the preliminary design and engineering stage uh, back in, well, actually back in April of 2018. We're effectively uh, ready to go to market. Now, you'll recall that in December, we received a notification from Metrolinx that they want to see whether or not the stations themselves uh, would spark any kind of private sector interest. Um, the one that you do know that uh, has interest right now is East Harbor. And uh, first, Gulf is a developer that's interested in, in moving forward with that particular station, so there are some discussions relative to that. Uh, we have not heard back from the province in terms of whether or not the other remaining stations, in fact, do lend themselves to private investment. So our capital cost estimate is $1.46 billion, which is our capped contribution uh, for that work. 
Relief Line South is a uh, new eight station subway connecting Line 2 at Pape Station to Line 1 at Queen and Osgood Stations. Um, we uh, believe that this is a critically important link in our system and the one that uh, speaks directly to the mounting uh, capacity challenge that we're facing uh, today and that uh, this project is one that should be advanced uh, certainly as quick as we can make that happen. Uh, right now, we're hoping to have the planning, uh, preliminary design and engineering completed by the first quarter of next year. The cost estimate at this point in time, which is a class five cost estimate, is in the order of 7.2 billion, which includes uh, uh, 400 uh, million related to preliminary uh, design and engineering and construction cost estimate of 6.8 billion. We can't stress enough the fact that a class five estimate is very early in the planning of such a important line and that the, uh, uh, the uh, error, if you will, if you want to call it that, is, is really, um, uh, could be cheaper than the price that we've uh, indicated here and could be considerably more up to maybe as much as 100% more. But given that we are just in our early phases of, of uh, design, this is the estimate that we can provide you at this time. Of course, as we get further uh, into design, this will, um, this figure is more than likely expected to change and we'd be updating council accordingly. Now, um, I don't think it's any secret, this is one of the lines that the province has expressed an interest in and we have not heard specifically what exactly the design considerations that they have are, uh, but we expect we'll be hearing that in the coming days um, as, uh, as the province does announce its funding uh, this Thursday. The next is uh, the Bloor Young Capacity Improvement. Uh, this is uh, a station expansion with modifications to address capacity constraints on line one. It is critical to ensure that the station can safely accommodate and the more than 200,000 passengers that use the station each day. Um, this is a, an important part of the overall network, one that uh, needs to be addressed. The owner, of course, is TTC. Um, the current phase where we're at is initiation development concept design on target for completion in 2019. So it's not as advanced as uh, the earlier projects I just mentioned. Uh, the capital cost estimate at this point, again, a class five is $1.05 billion. Next is the waterfront transit network, which consists of several transit expansion improvement projects, including priority as segment described as follows, the Union Station Queens Key Link is a streetcar loop extension, expands streetcar network capacity at Union Station to serve transit demand along the waterfront. Uh, no secret to anyone, there's tremendous amount of growth occurring and expected to grow on the waterfront, which necessitates the need for a, an adequate transit network. So of course the owner is TTC. The current phase is we're in the initiation development phase. We expect to go to PD, uh, uh, preliminary design and engineering in 2020. And again, the capital cost based on a class four, so slightly more design considerations been built in. The estimate is in the order of uh, $612 million. The next is the Eglinton East LRT, uh, which is an Eastern expansion of line five uh, and provides transit to underserved communities in the city and supports future growth and development. This is less of a, of a, uh, uh, a capacity or a health and safety matter. It's more of a uh, how Toronto is going to ensure that it grows in the manner which it has planned. Uh, so again, the, the uh, owner is Metrolinx. The current phase is the initiation development phase. So it's ready to move into preliminary design and engineering. The capital cost estimate at this point for uh, the first option to uh, the University of Toronto Scarborough campus is in the order of 1.6 billion or uh, 2 billion if we go with what is considered option three to Malvern. And again, both are in the order of, uh, of a class four estimate. The next slide, Eglinton West LRT, uh, Western extension of line five, uh, it improves rapid transit connections on Eglinton Avenue, to Avenue uh, Airport segment. It may also provide better access to Pearson Airport and support plans for transit hubs. So once again, um, this is a, a project that planning staff are, are deeply involved in. Uh, the asset itself is owned by Metrolinx. It's in the initiation development phase and as well the cost estimate, which is a class four estimate is in the order of 1.8 billion. So this again is a, a project that the province has expressed some interest in. 
Uh, and so we'll wait and see exactly their preferences for a, a subterranean uh, extension to the airport. But again, uh, we are uh, not able to provide uh, tremendous detail at this point in time. So if I can go to the next slide. So the transit, public transit infrastructure fund phase two or PTIF two as we commonly refer to it, obviously precedes the, the funding initiative that uh, the federal government had created whereby uh, 800 and uh, I believe $54 million was provided uh, to the city of Toronto to effectively address uh, uh, a state of, uh, of, of repair issues. In other words, was not focused on expansion, was uh, more focused on state of good repair projects of which uh, over $700 million was, was uh, provided to TTC uh, in order for them to acquire uh, fleet or address fleet considerations. So PTIF 2 is really more focused on expansion. So the City of Toronto uh, has been allocated $4.897 billion in federal funds and again this is based on ridership figures and included in that figure is the $660 billion in funding for Line 2 East Extension. And so the, the rules of this program basically are the federal government will contribute up to a maximum of 40% uh, of eligible expenditures. The province, of course, has a role to play and will contribute a minimum of 33% or $4.04 billion in new funding, uh, which that does not include the prior commitment that they had made of $1.4 billion in provincial funding for the Line 2 extension. And as well, under, uh, under this uh, program, the, the relationship between the federal, provincial, and the city is as follows, so it's 40% federal, 33% as a minimum uh, provincial and 27% uh, percent city, which would equate to about $3.305 billion for the City of Toronto. Next slide. So again, PTIF 2 uh, is designed to advance transit network expansion. So the key targets or objectives of the program are to address capacity issues as well as quality and or safety issues, which uh, I've identified we have uh, a number of projects that uh, do address that, as well as to improve access to public transit system as a whole. Uh, the province is responsible for identifying and prioritizing eligible projects through engagement with local regional governments and for submitting eligible projects to the federal government. So the final provincial municipal cost matching requirement will be determined through ongoing discussion as part of the Toronto Ontario Transit Responsibility Realignment Review, or as sometimes commonly referred to as the upload. So. Those will be uh, the, the discussions we'll be having in the coming days and weeks once we understand from the province uh, specifically what it wants to invest in and in particular the kinds of projects uh, which it has referred to uh, in the last week that uh, when we receive the specific design information that they have in mind. So again, to summarize the key considerations for PTIF 2 in this chart, you can see that we have City Council direction for Line 2 East Extension. We are uh, effectively ready to go to market. Uh, so our design work has been completed. We're looking to procure the, uh, the single station uh, project uh, at the end of this year. Uh, although, of course, that all may change to subject to what the provincial government may have in mind. So there will certainly be an impact on the uh, timing of this uh, badly needed infrastructure investment. Smart Track Stations program, as I've said, we're awaiting some uh, response by Metrolinx in terms of whether or not the stations are, uh, do lend themselves to private investment, uh, notwithstanding that one certainly has, uh, has created a, a certain amount of attention from a developer, and that being the uh, East Harbor. Um, in terms of the Bloor Young capacity improvement, I think it's important for you to uh, bear in mind that this is an important project from a safety and reliability standpoint because it, it does provide uh, platform capacity which is uh, badly needed and needs to be addressed as soon as possible. As well as Relief Line South, again, uh, a transit investment that will uh, address the challenges that we're facing on Line 1 and uh, is uh, right now at uh, uh, entering the preliminary uh, design and engineering phase and, and we're working on what is uh, commonly referred to as I said as a class 5 estimate. And then further down the line you have the waterfront uh, uh, projects as well as the Eglinton East and West projects identified as such. And so that will give you a very good idea. Now 
when you look at this list, you'll recall all with the exception of the smart track stations were approved by council back in 2016. Smart track stations were added to this list um, in 2017. And to the credit of council and staff, uh, this list uh, was generated before the formal program was announced last year in 2018. So uh, we are ready uh, to take advantage of the program subject to negotiations with the provincial government. So I'm just going to uh, now uh, remind us uh, financially where we're at. So recommended priorities again for PTIF 2 are as follows. The first, that again, our share is 4.89 billion, and that's based on a ridership uh, calculation. Uh, we are uh, saying very clearly, hopefully, that the, the 660 billion dollars, or 660 million, or 0.66 billion, as previously approved by City Council on October 2013, will be dedicated to the Line 2 East Extension project. That uh, 0.585 billion is previously approved by council in April 2018 for the Smart Track Stations program. And then we have 3.151 billion for the Relief Line South as described in the October 2018 environmental project report. And then finally half a billion dollars for the Bloor Young Capacity Improvement Project. That's what we're recommending to you for approval. And again, there's more work to do on the balance of the project. So again, staff will report back in the fall of 2019 prior to the 2020 budget process on the following funding and financing strategies for PTIF 2 priority projects, in particular Re Relief Line South, Bloor Young Station Capacity Improvement. And then of course, funding and financing strategies for projects that are not currently contemplated for funding under PTIF 2 program, and that include the Waterfront Transit Network, as well as the Eglinton East LRT. And then finally, outcome of ongoing discussions with the province on upload, realignment of transit responsibilities will also, uh, will also be providing recommendations. And so we'll likely be doing that last point uh, much sooner than the fall, but I think it's important for you to know that this is the order in which things are going to unfold. So again, in terms of the 13 recommendations, not my intent to read what's already in the report, but recommendation one uh, does speak to how we're recommending or what we're recommending in terms of PTIF 2 federal funding priorities. Uh, uh, recommendation two is the cost matching requirement of the province and city under PTIF 2 to be determined as per upload discussion. And then of course, uh, recommendation three uh, relates to authority. I am going to though slow down a bit on this slide because I think it's incredibly important that the line two east extension project Recommendation four, to be clear, City Council has approved 3.887, City Council approved 3.887 billion for the one-stop line two extension uh, project and request TTC to proceed with procurement and construction subject to the prov province providing written support for the project and confirmation of the province's previous funding commitment by May 15th of 2019 and the city finalizing agreements for federal and provincial funding by November 30th, 2019. Recommendation five, subject to fulfillment of the conditions set out in recommendation four, city council amend the council approved 2019, 2028 capital budget and plan for the relief line, or not relief line, it's a line two extension project and approve the project funding plan. Recommendation six, city council amend noise bylaw to add uh, line two uh, to the list of exempted transit projects. And then recommendation seven, that should part A or B of recommendation four not be met, city council direct staff to report to the city council with an assessment of the cost schedule and operational impacts associated with changing the scope and or delivery model of the line two extension project and principles to guide further discussions with the project, or province, sorry. And then the uh, waterfront transit uh, network, again, I'm not going to read what is already in the report, but it does specify what our best advice is to you in terms of those recommendations. And that includes the next slide, uh, Eglinton West Light Rail Transit. And then finally, a recommendation 13, City Council requests the City Manager and, and CFO and Treasurer to report prior to the launch of the 2020 budget on funding and finance options for the Relief Line South, Bloor Young Capacity Improvement and the balance of the projects including but not limited to the preliminary design engineering phase of waterfront transit and as well as the procurement and construction uh, phase of the waterfront transit projects as identified. So 
with that, I know I ran through it fairly quick, uh, but we are certainly ready for questions, although I think you may be going to the... Uh, I think what we would do is have the deputations next and then have you come back yeah. uh, for uh, questions uh, to be asked about this presentation and about the report. So may I just at this juncture say uh, to you, uh, uh, Chris, and also to James uh, Perjula and to Karen Thorburn, who's there with you, Thank you, and, and, and the whole team. I mean, I've probably involved 200 people, I'm not sure, and the TTC and everywhere else. But look, whatever people may think about individual elements of the report, it involves an incredible amount of hard work over a very long period of time. And I think the report is very complete and it's very thoughtful, and we'll hear all kinds of views on it today from here and from there. But I just want to say thank you for the hard work, because I think it's, uh, it's a big piece of work, and I think it's uh, something that gives us lots to chew on. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. And thanks for the presentation. And we will now uh, move to the deputations. Uh, and uh, a reminder that uh, we're going to have three minutes uh, for each person to uh, speak. There may be questions uh, asked of deputants, I think, as you know. Uh, so let's start with uh, Tim, uh, make sure I pronounce it correctly, Cocker, the Waterfront Business Improvement Area. Or is it Cosser? Okay. I, 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 not, neither of the above. Thank you for being here. I apologize for taking a stab at the name and not just asking. You have, uh, you're, you're most welcome here, and you have three minutes. Uh, the opportunity to speak today. I'm Tim Coker, Executive Director with the Waterfront BIA, and with me is Kevin Curry, the Chair of our BIA's Board of Management. Our mandate is to support the development of a well-connected waterfront destination and support the continued growth of our business community. We're here today to talk about the Waterfront East LRT. Our business members have hist historical knowledge of the LRT. They've known the disruption that transit improvements can cause temporarily, but they also know the benefits of a better connected waterfront. Oh, sorry about that. The community is very grateful for the higher standard provided by the City of Toronto. There we go. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> the community is very grateful for the higher standard provided along the waterfront by the City of Toronto, the TTC, and Waterfront Toronto. We're pleased that the East LRT is moving from needs assessment to preliminary design and engineering as part of today's recommendations to step in the right direction, but we're here to request that more be done to accelerate its construction. The Eastern Waterfront in Portlands is the largest development opportunity in the Greater Toronto Area. The BIA had an economic impact study completed by Hatch. The study indicates that if the East LRT was completed by 2025 through the Portlands, over the next 20 years it would support office space equivalent to seven First Canadian places and living spaces equivalent to more than two Liberty Villages. The LRT is vital to unlocking this growth and we need transit to support it as soon as possible. There are already 25,000 people working south of the Gardner Expressway each day and we surveyed these waterfront commuters in March and they said build it, we'll use it. 53% of waterfront commuters said they would be more likely to use public transit if additional subway and LRT connections were in place connecting the downtown and the waterfront. That includes 40% of car commuters surveyed. Planning and design work must be continued to be ready to build the LRT soon. And we'd request an accelerated timeline or study of an accelerated timeline for interim phase solutions. And what I mean by this is there will be issues related to the four or five year construction timeline for the Queen's Key to Union Station Tunnel that's referred to in attachment three. We request that that study include potential options to have phased construction where the east-west connectivity for the LRT is in place faster. In public consultations, city staff indicated it may be possible to have that east-west connectivity in place prior to the five years of construction that would be required for the tunnel. We look forward to working together with the city, TTC and Waterfront Toronto and further developing plans for Waterfront Transit. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Did I see Councillor Cressy's hand up? Yep, Councillor Cressy. Hi, uh, Tim and Kevin, thank you for being here. The economic impact study that you commissioned by Hatch, yes. can you, you alluded to existing population, the 25,000 who live south of Gardner. Can you walk through some of, the, some of the feedback from that study that Hatch conducted for us in terms of the economic impacts associated with both building and accelerating the design? So the survey you referred to is actually referring to 25,000 people that work south of the Gardner. Yeah. We but um, the economic impact study did say that building the LRT, and this is the completed LRT through the Portlands to Leslie and Coxwell, essentially. Hatch thought that um, 25,000 new residential units would be unlocked. That's room for about 67,000 people and 132,000 jobs. That's the seven first Canadian places I referred to. 
Okay, so, so that I understand. So we're, if we were to build it, the full waterfront east, the study concluded that those additional jobs would be created and those 25,000 units would be created. Yeah, over the 20 years after it was in place. Well, by 2045, so 20 years is between 25 and 45. Okay, and, and just so that I understand, the, the feedback, the comments you were giving around acceleration, so in attachment three, it refers to the connection between Union Station and Queen's Key and the fixed link connection. Can you expand upon what you were talking about, about how you could accelerate the east-west were you talking about Queen's Key through the Portlands as the acceleration of the east-west component while the tunnel connect is being built? Attachment three right now is referring to a build where the tunnel would be expanded and then the east LRT would be built soon to Parliament. So the first phase essentially the okay. patch was reviewing as well. I put it up on the screen here. This is the map, I believe it's figure one in attachment three and um, these are my notes on it. But because the tunnel requires that significant construction disruption that would need to be planned for anyway, the public consultations we were in, there was quite a few comments, including from staff, indicating it might be possible to get the east-west LRT connectivity there to help support additional growth like in advance of waiting for that five-year tunnel construction. Okay, so building on some of the economic impact analysis that's been done, if we were to accelerate the construction of the east-west line without the fixed link tunnel connection, we could unlock some of that growth while we build the tunnel to have true ridership improvement with the fixed link. Yes. Okay, understood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank Councilor Cressy, other uh, members of the committee or other visiting members of council, uh, members of the committee. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate you. your deputation. Uh, next, we have Raymond Shen. Morning, Mr. Shen. You have uh, three minutes. You're most welcome. Good morning. I'm here today because of the TTC mantra, if you see something, say something. I see an elephant in the room. The elephant is ridership. Ridership was not considered when deciding the Shepherd subway. The Shepherd subway runs nearly empty most of the time. Hundreds of millions of dollars were spent to build the subway stations to be used by a few hundred people. There is no projected ridership for the downtown relief line. In last May's executive committee meeting for Agenda Smart, Smart Track, Councillor Davis asked about ridership. Her question went unanswered. Councillor Ainsley asked for an explanation of the discrepancy between Metrolink's 15 minute service and the city's claim of more frequent service. Apparently, the Memorandum of Understanding for Smart Tracks specifies the frequency of service, but it has never been released to the public, nor read by councillors who voted without reading it. Deputy Mayor Bayo asked about fair integration. An extra charge of $1.50 is required to transfer from TTC to GO instead of an integrated fare. Ridership on Smart Track is greatly affected by frequency of service and fare integration. There is no ridership projection for Smart Track with the extra dollar fifty charge and fifteen minute service. Okay. Regarding ridership for the line two extension, it was projected to be in twenty thirteen it was projected to be fourteen thousand at rush hour. Ridership was lowered to twenty in 2016 to 7,500. Line two extension will be running two thirds empty during rush hour in 2055. So the elephant in the room is ignoring ridership. The elephant may become a white elephant, just like the Shepherd subway. We are also spending too much money going backwards. The Young Bluer station expansion of passenger capacity is estimated at $1 billion. The St. George station, which has no overflow capacity, is potentially more dangerous. Rather than building a bigger Band-Aid, we should be building another rapid transit route. I digress. I repeat, the elephant in the room is ignoring ridership. That elephant may become a white elephant, just like the Shepherd subway. The mantra, if you see something, say something, only applies if someone is listening. Thank you, Mr. Shen. Are there questions of the deputy? All right, seeing none, I'll thank you very much for being here today, and we'll move to Martin Green, the Eglinton West Light Rail Transit Community Working Group. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Green. Uh, you have three minutes. Good morning, Your Worship and Councillors. 
I'm speaking this morning as chair of the Eglinton West LRT Community Working Group, established at the direction of council in December 2017. You should all have our three reports, and I encourage you to read them and to ask questions. We believe the primary goal of the Eglinton West LRT should be to provide rapid transit service for air travelers and workers in the airport employment area. The capacity, level of service, and upgrade capability should accommodate reason reasonably projected user demand and service expectations over a 60-year period. The City's plans for an at-grade Eglinton West LRT are not consistent with that goal. Inexplicably, they ignore air travelers and workers in the airport employment area north of the 401. This is a critical error. Over 400,000 workers in the airport employment area need better transit. To match airports at other great cities, the GTAA wants over 40,000 more travelers to use transit every day. These numbers imply far more riders than indicated in the city's LRT plans. Our investigation of grade separation revealed that the primary concern is not grade, but whether or not the LRT is separated from the roads. If the LRT is fully separated from traffic and signals of the roads network, then trains can run every two minutes instead of every three or four minutes. Service is faster, more predictable and reliable, and more attractive to riders. Most importantly, a fully separated LRT will move twice as many people, and that capacity is needed. Without the airport and surrounding employment, there will be no need for an Eglinton West LRT. Simply upgrade bus service is demand gross. Save over a billion dollars. But that would abandon the primary goal, providing rapid transit that serves as many airport area workers and air travelers as possible. To meet the goal, we recommend that the Eglinton West LRT be fully separated from the roads. To achieve this, it should be above grade across the Humber Valley, then tunneled below grade through central Etobicoke to west of Highway 427. From there to the airport, it should continue to be fully separated from the roads. Data provided by the project team indicates a fully separated LRT will cost $2.3 billion. Those are 2014 dollars. Our business case analysis shows benefits that outweigh costs by a ratio of 3.1. Our report discusses significant issues with traffic and ridership modeling. The methodologies have serious limitations and the results are highly suspect. We recommend use of macro models informed by demographics and strategic plans for development and growth instead of micro simulation. We found that the city's rapid transit evaluation framework used to compare alternatives lacks objectivity and is vulnerable to bias. Almost any desired outcome can be achieved by manipulation of the process. In place of it, we recommend a decision support system that combines all inputs in an objective manner, not subject to bias. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be pleased to answer your questions. Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Green. Uh, are there questions of the Deputy to Councillor Holliday, Deputy Mayor? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'm going to steal a couple seconds just to say thank you to Mr. Green and the Community Working Group. Um, it was through your leadership that they were established, and they've worked uh, for almost 18 months, uh, 13 people. Uh, through meetings with staff and then eventually meetings on their own and have put an enormous amount of hours into the research they've done to bring uh, them to the point that they could come speak to the executive committee and I would encourage everyone to look at the reports as Mr. Green stated. Uh, there's a lot of detail in there but um, through you to uh, Mr. Green, I wondered if you could just elaborate a bit more. You touched on the, the uh, rapid transit evaluation framework, which is the tool that we have to analyze the case for a lot of these projects. And we've applied that to a number of transit projects. But what was your group's finding in terms of um, how that tool worked? And did you have a, some other thoughts on how to do it better, maybe? Uh, yes. The what we found was that we were asked for input in terms of criteria that would be used in some ranking scheme that, that assigned equal weighting to eight different categories of criteria. So we provided extensive input, I think 87 separate criteria that we addressed. One of the primary criteria we included was the capacity of the, of the line. If the line is separated from the roads, uh, it's not subject to traffic signals and uh, it's documented in the uh, Crosstown website that in fact uh, you can run every two minutes instead of every three or four minutes. Uh, so you can greatly increase the capacity. That we put in as a criterion. The project team removed that as a criterion saying well it's just an operational issue. So it basically nullified the benefit of having a separated LRT in their application of the process. And so that's the, the ability of whoever's using this to manipulate the outcome 
based on their selective inclusion of criteria and selective weighting of criteria. A, there's a far more uh, objective and uh, robust process that we have recommended. It's called analytic network process. It's quite mathematically sophisticated. It's supported by software and there's good consulting. There are university courses on it. But it basically takes input from all stakeholders all experts and combines that input in a sophisticated manner to, to determine your rankings uh, through a, a, this mathematical analysis. Um, one of the things we heard uh, over and over again in the community at the community meetings was the concern over traffic impact um, from construction and even a possible solution that modified the, the workings of Eglinton Avenue. Um, and part of the process of your group was to dig into the processes used by city staff to develop their recommendations in the report around traffic modeling. Could you tell the executive committee what you found with uh, your investigation of those models and any brief recommendations going forward on how we could do that better as well? Okay, so uh, the project team actually organized one of the meetings had the, the consulting firm that was doing the traffic modeling. So they came in and presented how their, their model works. Uh, it, defines a, an area that uh, I think extends for about three kilometers around the, the LRT and takes data from the boundary, the, the inputs, the flows in and out of that area, and then models in detail the traffic flow uh, within the area. It's called a, a micro simulation, so every, every vehicle on the road is modeled as part of this. In talking with the people who are doing it, they agreed that, that probably going beyond 10 years would not give you any useful results. Now, in the report that the city manager has presented, there are projections for 2041, which is almost 20 years out, which is way beyond what the consultant suggested was, would be viable. Those should, that result from the report indicates that the traffic along Eglinton Avenue between Mount Dennis and uh, Renforth would be slowed by about a factor of two at peak towers. So instead of 18 minutes, it could take you 40 or 42 minutes. Uh, that's not where we want to go, clearly, and so a more strategic approach is needed to developing a, a, a plan for traffic, and this, this strategic we need to look at what can we do with transit to reduce the ridership. None of that what-if scenario was done. If we put the LRT separate from the roads and we've got good service, then we may be able to drive, uh, draw significant ridership you know, away from cars, but, but none of that analysis was done. It's a, so it, a micro simulation is really not a way to, to do long range planning. It's, it's only good for, for short time intervals. Thank you, that was the last question. Are uh, there other questions of this deputant? Okay, well hearing none, I'll thank you very much, uh, Mr. Green. Uh, and we'll move to Sarisa Virinci. Good morning. Thanks very much for being here, and uh, you have three minutes. Um, thank you, Honorable Committee. I'm Srisa Varinci. I'm a student of the University of Toronto Schools, but more importantly, I'm a resident of Malvern. Um, I commute to and from uh, school every single day, and next year I'm leaving to boarding school in the U.S., so I wanted to personally do something to support my community in terms of the transit situation that it faces currently. So today um, I come to you not to speak about the benefits of public transit for Toronto, uh, nor the city's need for it, for that has already been acknowledged. I come to you to appeal in my limited capacity for the expansion of transit plans to Malvern through the diversion of funds into the Eglinton East LRT. The Scarborough subway, uh, which is painted to be the herald of the transit expansion to Scarborough by city and province alike, is uh, in no way that. It does not provide the local transit connections and the transit network that Scarborough so desperately needs. A one-stop extension of Line 2 from, the, uh, from Kennedy Station to the Scarborough Town Center does not provide, in fact, the local connections that Scarborough needs. Upgrading the current crumbling Scarborough RT to the modern LRT uh, systems, uh, in fact, reduces uh, the cost of the one-stop Scarborough extension by $2.5 billion. This is funding that can easily be diverted and used for the Eglinton East LRT, something that will benefit Scarborough much more. 
To the inhabitants of Malvern and those of Scarborough and Tyre, the treatment we receive pertaining to public transit from City Hall is viewed as a slighting of those who need it the most, the deprived, the unfortunate, the underprivileged, the poverty-stricken, marginalized communities that populate Toronto's third city. Those who lack even the basic functions of upward mobility due in major part to the lack of sustainable, efficient, and affordable public transit. The lack of this fundamental need, the creation of transit deserts, constrains individuals from being able to find a job, the basic essential need to any individual. This is a direct, undeniable cause of the inequality we see permeating today's society and trickling down through generations. Poorer families are less likely to invest in education and skills, for they simply do not have the resources. This makes their children less likely to gain a high pay, higher paying job, and uh, their ability to escape this vicious cycle is drastically reduced. The very fact that public transportation, which should cater to those who need it the most, those farthest away from the center of economic stimulus, has done the exact opposite in Toronto. And that is quite frankly appalling. Not only will these public transportation projects create corridors for better access to downtown, they provide inter-Scarborough travel access, reversing the destructive but popular car culture trend of suburbia. It will also promote growth and community sense in the areas that lack those the most. If you, at the end of the day, Honorable Committee, support the elimination the process of the elimination of inequality, the accurate representation of the citizens of Toronto's interests, the growth of the marginalized, relegated, and underprivileged communities of Malvern. You support the Eglinton East LRT and its extension to Malvern. All right. I'll ask, thank you very much. Uh, there was a question from Councillor Carroll. Thank you uh, so much for coming today. Because uh, this is a long journey. Um, so uh, you understand that, that when, you, when you say that really if we went back to, to the LRT plan, that, that we save the money that can be used uh, elsewhere, you understand that uh, the knee-jerk response would be, oh, that's a delay. We change to the, the subway plan, that's a delay. Uh, you understand that, that, that people would throw that up as an obstacle. So um, in terms of you know, diverting funding and then going through the planning stages again for the LRT, therefore that would yeah. uh, sort of delay any sort of public transportation investment that could happen in Scarborough? Yeah. But the delay that it may cause, and it will, it will inevitably cause, is definitely a small price to pay in terms of the larger growth that will create for Scarborough, the larger benefit at the end that will happen for the residents of Scarborough that in fact are the ones that need it the most. Right. So um, your your proposal then, uh, if we were to, to go back to that route, we do get almost to Malvern and, and that would be a logical place to then extend and keep going because that, that uh, LRT was going to stop at Centennial College, Tunnel under and come up a little, uh, a little bit east of the Chinese Cultural Centre, almost to Nielsen Road almost to Shepherd and Nielsen. And then if you're going to extend it from there, you would go up to Malvern Town Centre. That. So, so uh, that would, be, if, we, if we were going to delay, that would be a more sensible delay and serve more people than say today, sticking with the plan that you criticize and then adding some way to get to Malvern somewhere else that would be an even longer delay. Exactly, yes. That's right. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today. Thanks, uh, Councillor Carroll. Uh, other questions of this deputy? All right, well, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, we have next uh, Andre Sorensen. Good morning, Mr. Sorensen. You have three minutes, and then there may be some questions. Thank you. Um, dear Mayor Tory and Executive Council, I'm a professor at the University of Toronto in Geography and Planning. Uh, in 2015, I published a report on transit options for Scarborough uh, that found that the Eglinton East LRT provided the most uh, development potential of any of the transit uh, options in Scarborough, and I've been following this uh, 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 planning processes over the last several years very closely. So I'm here to urge you to put the Eglinton East LRT line to UTSC and Malvern uh, back on the, the priority transit projects list in Toronto. And I, I, first, I wanted to commend the city uh, for all the excellent work done over the last three years by city staff on the design and public consultations for this project. Uh, by all accounts, there's really strong support in Scarborough for a surface LRT along the Eglinton East LRT route. 
Um, so the, ex the extension of Eglinton LRT to UTST and later Malvern should be a top priority for the City of Toronto, I would argue, for six reasons. First, for the investment, this line will deliver improved transit service for more Toronto residents than any of the other projects currently under consideration, and large numbers of low-income residents live within walking distance of this route. Second, most trips by Scarborough residents are within Scarborough, so the EELRT will be much more valuable for Scarborough residents than the Line 2 extension to Scarborough Town Centre, which will serve primarily trips to and from downtown, which are a much smaller share of trips in Scarborough. Third, UTSC is a high value and major destination that is currently not served by rapid transit. Buses running in traffic vary enormously in trip times, greatly reducing the attractiveness of transit as a travel option to and from UTSC. Fourth, there's enormous potential for redevelopment and intensification along this corridor that will also help transform Scarborough into a more transit-oriented and pedestrian-friendly part of the city. Fifth, Electric-powered transit is one of the most effective ways for Toronto to reduce carbon emissions, and this line will replace hundreds of diesel bus trips and thousands of car trips every day with electric-powered LRTs. Sixth, and I think this is incredibly important, this line can be built very quickly compared to any of the proposed subway projects, which are all still a decade or more away from being in service. This line can be up and running before any of the subway, pro subway projects and could be a major legacy of this term of council. So I urge you to prioritize the Eglinton East LRT and push it forward as quickly as possible. Thank you for your Thank you, attention. Mr. Sorensen. Right on the dot of three minutes. Well done. Uh, questions from Councillor Perks. Dr. Sorensen, thank you for this and, and for the various contributions you've made over the years. One of the, uh, you presented a lot of uh, uh, data and, and evidence for why you think the Eglinton East LRT would be a, a preferred route. Uh, do you see anything in the, this document or any other city document ever that makes the kind of comparison that you just made? I, I uh, no. No. Uh, it's not a routine part of transit planning to look at the development potential, although I think that is increasingly part of the picture for, yeah. And uh, if you haven't seen anything in terms of uh, the ability to deploy it quickly or the ability to, once deployed, expand it, or you, you've seen none of that kind of analysis in, in this document or any other city document? In terms of development potential along different corridors. That's correct. No, I, I don't think that is a, a routine part of transit planning. On the, I, I think that one of the top priorities should be looking at that potential. And one, I want, the, one of the pieces of the report that we authored showed was that it's very, there is actually very little development capacity in most of our suburbs because they were planned to be stable and we protect the stab stability of existing residential neighborhoods. So it's really along corridors like LRT and along Shepherd East that you have a lot of possibility for intensification and redevelopment, whereas in um, most of the suburbs, it's, there's a very restricted development capacity. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Perks. Uh, and are there any other questions? Uh, Councillor McAlvey, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Tari. Uh, thank you for coming in today, Professor, Professor Sorensen. Um, you spoke about development potential and economic development. So do you think there's considerable potential for the Aglutini LRT to spur those things in Malvern? In Malvern? Um, I would say less. I think in, in because of the urban form of Malvern, there's significant development potential really around the shopping mall there. Okay, around and, Malvern and, Center. Right. Around Malvern Center there is. Okay. But elsewhere in Malvern, not so much. Right, because it's residential. Yeah, and the, the distinctive thing about Eglinton and Kingston Road is there are large lots all the way fronting along that arterial road. And farther north, north of the 401, the metro planning regime made sure that there were very few large parcels fronting on the arterial roads. They just wanted traffic on those roads. They did not want 
driveways and people interrupting through traffic. So they were designed to be very difficult to redevelop as corridors, whereas the Eglinton corridor is uh, all, all the way to UTSC has a lot of development potential. So there's potential around Melbourne Centre, but because of that lack of development that they've had in economic um, in particular, they're travelling very long distances to get to work. So it's a very transit-starved area where there are long commutes. Right. Okay. So building an LRT that connects eventually along Eglinton East with Shepherd and having a fully connected system, this can really help people to get to where they need to go to work so they have more time to spend with their friends and their family. I agree. And more likely to use transit and not cars. And, and the network is also, of course, extremely important. So both the Shepherd East LRT and the from Kennedy up to to Malvern makes sense as a network. So connectivity of different transit lines is paramount if you really want to realize the full benefits that transit can bring. Everybody who studies transit agrees that the network is extremely important. Isolated lines by themselves don't make transit, uh, transit really an attractive option. Okay, so as you say, so transit can bring development, it can bring jobs, and it can get people to where they need to go faster, it can improve climate, uh, fight climate change, and give us more times with our friends and our family. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKelvey. Uh, we had Councillor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor Tory. Uh, Professor Sorensen, thanks for coming in this morning. Um, I wanted to ask you once again about the Eglinton East LRT, and you've been involved Following this, I've been following your reading and your social media since Mayor, former Mayor Miller came up with Transit City. So when you look at the Eglinton East LRT to UTSC, um, if we did something today, so we did away with the phasing and we moved it all the way to Malvern in one phase, do you think that's viable? I guess it depends on what you mean by viable. I mean, as you know, there are advantages doing it all the way to Malvern in one go because of the storage and maintenance facility can be on Conlon's Drive. And so it saves some money to do it all at once. Uh, yeah, I, I, and there are clear benefits for the people who would use that line. There's a, there's a lot of population on that line that's very poorly served with transit now. Right, but if you had to prioritize to U of T Scarborough first or Malvern, you would just write to Malvern? Uh, I, 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 I guess I would say if uh, the, this project could be uh, started at the very soonest possible by starting with the, the UTSC piece, that makes sense. If the money can be uh, uh, allocated to go all the way to Malvern and do it all at once, I think that also makes sense. Okay. Uh, the sooner it gets started, the better in my view. Okay. Which in the report today is phase one at U of T Scarborough and then the yeah. second phase we're looking at is to Malvern. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Tory. Thanks, Councillor Ainsley. Uh, are there other questions for this deputant? All right. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Sorensen. Thank we you. appreciate your attendance very much and your comments. Uh, Michael Manu, Toronto Youth Cabinet. Good morning. Good morning. We have three minutes and then there may be some questions for you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Good morning, Executive Committee members. Uh, my name is Michael Manu and I'm the budget lead for the Toronto Youth Cabinet, the official youth advisory body to the city. Thank you for listening to my deputation. I have come to express my support for the Eglinton East LRT and implore the Executive Committee to fund the project. As a lifelong resident of East Scarborough, primarily in the Kingston, Galloway and Orton Park and Scarborough Village neighborhoods, transit upgrades are well overdue for our community. Save for one new express bus and a pilot for the 12D on Kingston Road, I can't think of much else that has been done to improve transit for folks in our community. When I was a kid approximately 12 years ago, Transit City was announced, and I remember being very excited to have a rapid transit line serving my neighborhood. Fast forward 12 years, and it seems as though we are still at day one. When I think of the potential that the Eglinton East LRT has for Scarborough, it is hard to not be excited. The line will improve service for people who currently rely on transit along the corridor, attract new transit users, and encourage active transportation. I also believe that the Eglinton East LRT is important in general for attracting investment, development, and jobs for the people of East Scarborough. With the upcoming development in Golden Mile, this line will allow for many to access a multitude of new opportunities. 
As indicated in city reports, the line is slated to travel through several neighborhood improvement areas. I want to take it a step further and emphasize that it will not only travel through, but connect these neighborhoods as well. On a recent trip to New York City, I was fascinated by the history of the A train, which was monumental in connecting the black communities in Harlem in Upper Manhattan and Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. It also increased access to jobs and housing for this group of people at the time. I believe that the Eglinton East LRT can do the same thing for the historically underserved people of our community, whether it is from Malvern to KGO or from Ion View to Scarborough Village. Right now, as a Scarborough resident, based on the actions of previous administrations, I have very little faith in seeing significant transit improvement in our community. Oftentimes, it feels like transit in Scarborough is used as a tool for political gain and nothing more. It is extremely disheartening to go to a community meeting and hear older people tell me that they don't think they'll be alive to actually use the line, not because of old age, but because of our inability to stick to a plan um, past a term of office. The time has come to take action for and invest in Scarborough. With the potential changes to transit governance in Toronto, it appears as if the Eglinton East LRT is slated to lose priority status and the funding associated with it. Now is the time to fund the project and deliver what was supposed to be done a long time ago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Manu. Uh, are there questions for the deputy? Uh, Councillor McKelvey. Hi, thank you. You mentioned uh, the Kingston Galloway, Orton Park, Mornell, and then you also mentioned Malvern as well. So you think that north of the 401 also has neighborhoods that could be well served by transit also? Definitely. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, Councillor. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Councillor Ainsley. Yeah. Morning, Michael. Thanks for coming in again. Um, so I just want, so what we're looking at today is the first phase of the Eglinton East LRT up to U of T Scarborough, as you know, it goes through five neighborhood improvement areas, including KGO. So if we took the second phase up to Malvern and put it all in, in one, which is going to extend the building and the construction to even see the first phase, do you think you residents in KGO would find that acceptable? Um, I mean, I guess you would have to ask them directly. I don't, I don't live in KGO anymore. I think that definitely um, the fact that we keep on delaying on transit, we keep on delaying on building these lines, um, isn't going to settle well with, with the people in our area. But I do think that, um, again, looking at the whole line and, and looking at the phasing, um, to be able to connect the Malvern community with those south of the 401 as well is very important. And if that can be done as early as possible, um, as was indicated by the previous speaker, Andre, uh, I think that that stands to benefit for, for Scarborough as a whole um, because you know, once we, once we finish phase one and, you know, we don't have the, the, the capacity or the capital to be able to get phase two done or the costs increase um, more than what has been proposed right now in the reports, then that's an issue that we'll have to deal with. So if we can get it done now, I think that um, the people of KGO, um, if, if, it'll, if it'll delay the project a, a small amount, for the better, for the long term, it'll, it'll, it'll be best for Scarborough. Great. Thank you. Thanks for coming in this morning. Thanks, uh, Councillor Ainsley. And uh, any other questions for the deputy? All right, well, thank you very much for coming, sir. Appreciate that. And we move next to Jamal Myers. Hello, Mr. Myers, thank you for coming. And uh, you have three minutes, and then there may be some questions. Thank you. Uh, good morning, members of the Executive Committee and Mayor Tory. My name is Jamal Myers, and I'm a volunteer with Scarborough Transit Action and a resident of Scarborough Guildwood. I would like to thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to speak. I'm here today to speak in favor of prioritizing the funding of the Eglinton East LRT as a rapid transit project that Scarborough desperately needs. The 15-kilometer, 24-stop Eglinton East LRT runs through seven priority neighborhoods, two post-secondary campuses, and into Malvern. It connects neighborhoods, businesses, and communities to one another and to the rest of Toronto and significantly cuts TTC commute times that are commonly one and a half to two hours each way as up to 40,000 residents could walk to a rapid transit stop instead of having to take the bus to one. It is also the only rapid transit project planned for Scarborough that concurrently serves the needs of the 48% of Scarborough transit riders that use the TTC to commute within Scarborough and the 23% of transit riders heading downtown. The Eglinton East LRT is also consistent with the goals of the 2015 Toronto Poverty Reduction Strategy 
was called for, quote, improved transit services in the inner suburbs by increasing reliability across bus, subway, and LRT modes, and considering the needs of low-income neighborhoods and inner suburbs in capital and service, service planning, end quote. More than 133 Scarbarians are low-income, one in four kids live in poverty, and one in five families are headed by single women. According to a large, ongoing Harvard study, the single biggest factor determining whether these families and individuals can escape poverty are commute times, i.e. the longer their commutes, the less their chances are of achieving upward mobility. My own story of growing up in Scarborough bears this out. I grew up in public housing and I was raised by a single mom. We didn't have a car, so the TTC was our only way to get around. Fortunately, I could walk to Kennedy Station and later Warden when we moved, which meant I could attend a great high school in the beaches, get an after-school job downtown, and participate in extracurricular activities around Toronto. In my last year of high school, my family moved to Malvern, and since the commute between the beaches and Malvern would have been too long, I moved in with family members that lived near my high school. Living in the beaches meant that I could easily take the 24-hour Queen Street car, which allowed me to take a summer job in university cleaning subway trains at the TTC's Greenwood Yard. My shift was between 8.30 p.m. to 5 a.m. Had I stayed in Malvern, I couldn't have taken this job because there simply would have been no way for me to get from Greenwood to Malvern at 5 a.m. Without this job, I couldn't have afforded to pay my tuition and would not have been able to pursue my dream of becoming a lawyer. The Eglinton East LRT offers thousands of families and young people living in Scarborough the same opportunity to escape poverty like I had. I'll just ask you to just take 20 seconds to conclude. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, in making your decision, I respectfully ask that you consider the impact the Eglinton East would have on transforming people's lives, particularly people in, living in poverty and working their very hardest to try to get out of it. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Myers. Uh, questions of the deputant? Uh, Councillor McKelvey. Hi, thank you for coming in today. Um, so you were mentioning you used to live in Malvern? I live just south of Malvern, but I'm in Malvern quite a bit. And what was your commute like to get to work? And you said you moved. I, so I, I live at 401 in Nielsen, so my okay. commute on average is about an hour and a half daily. About an hour and a half? Hour and a half. Um, so you think there's significant potential for the Eglinton East LRT, should it be extended into Malvern to improve the amount of time that you could spend with your family, your friends and residents can Definitely. So I also sit on the board of Taibu Community Health Center, okay. and the board um, passed a resolution in support of the Eglinton East LRT because we recognize that it would help patients get to the center in terms of when they're doing either their doctor's appointments or participating in things like Malvern Eats. Um, so yes, I think there's significant um, chances of improving the lives of people living in Malvern. So um, somebody just sent me a, an income uh, map for Scarborough, um, and it looks like north of 401, the average income is considerably lower than south of 401. Is that kind of the lived experience you see? Uh, really, yeah. That's basically what we see uh, at uh, Taibu. And also in the staff report right now, all Scarborough transit projects, so the Scarborough subway and the Eglinton East, they're both proposing to stop south of 401 or phase. Um, do you think that's fair to the residents that live north of 401, that we stop everything south of 401? Uh, no, because I think the residents north of 401 desperately need that line more than probably most people in Toronto. There's currently no way to get to the city or to get to any jobs unless you take public transit. Um, and if you're going downtown, unless you're taking multiple buses. It takes me an hour and a half. I'm sure it takes most, some of them, two hours, so an hour and 45 minutes. And I think that's really unfair, considering they've been waiting almost 10 years now for this line. Okay. And it was promised to them repeatedly. Thank you for making the long commute in today. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Mr. Mars. Are there other questions of the deputy? Well, well, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, Hamish Wilson, next. Wilson, you know the rules here, uh, three minutes, and thanks for coming. Yeah, it's a shame that it's only three minutes when there's so much that's less good about uh, <clears throat> what our transit is and what it isn't. Uh, and I was thinking with all the billions and all the plans and the back and forth, well, let's just make a game out of it, see what happens. Hey, Carservatus Car wins, stock TTC, et cetera, stack TTC, oh, there's a fair hike, no, oh, oops, what's a billion? I'm sorry, there's just so much vagueness and back and forth and this and that. Um, we 
are focused more on the big fixes rather than the things that have, I think, greater effectiveness with political will of keeping it simply surface. Uh, and one of the big problems that we have is the tunnel vision up in Scarborough. Uh, I'm sorry that Scarborough subway, we've got to spend money in Scarborough. This, this subway uh, extension, whatever you want to call it, is not good value. It says so in the report. It's finally out. It's not good value. So please make a motion. Withdraw the, all the support for the Scarborough subway extension and reallocate that support for the, for the Eglinton uh, East LRT and the money thereof. It's a, the Eglinton uh, LRT and the LRTs generally are in are much better, uh, much better value for the money. Uh, <clears throat> and quite honestly, the planning is getting suspect. Uh, you probably saw this, uh, this uh, I hope you swear, where is it here? Um, Scarborough subway cost estimates are far higher than council told. Now, I'm sorry, your, your whole process has gotten really smelly. Uh, how you how we get a little bit pregnant with a big uh, project? Uh, oops, what's four hundred million dollars? You were misinformed uh, somehow, and that's wrong. Uh, we've got a, you should pay a penalty for having this uh, this uh, this estimate uh, up to four billion now. It's just not good value. Let's retreat from this Scarborough subway extension. There are other options to help Scarborough. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the, the LRTs are one thing, the Smart Spur uh, LRT, uh, or uh, Smart, Smart Spur uh, project to uh, rebuild parts of the RT to uh, advantage of the smart, uh, take advantage of the, the east-west uh, connection up at the top of uh, 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 the Scarborough Town Center. That's better deal as well. And now I have to, oh, and I also think that there's a lot of value in using the uh, hydro corridor or thinking about it. With relief, uh, yes, we need relief, but we need to have relief function not necessarily a subway. Uh, that involves going surface far more than what we've had. That was 1942 using the Don Valley. Uh, let's see where, I, there was another one, uh, maybe, okay, this is 20 odd years ago, again using surface to get up to Eglinton. Eglinton's gonna come online, we've gotta get up to Eglinton as soon as possible. Um, uh, there's another option, uh, meeting the GO train, it looks like, uh, and again, I'd like to get surface up to there rather than, uh, than, uh, than uh, uh, the, the big tunnel, because we're in a crisis. Uh, I'll have to the, ask you to uh, wrap up, Mr. Yep. <clears throat> uh, I, I wouldn't actually mind having a reset, like I don't trust the province at all, I think they're going to be very bad for us. But uh, our plans are not doing well enough. Uh, back away from the Scarborough subway, please. Uh, it's overdue. Put the money into uh, into the uh, the uh, the, uh, the LRT, especially. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wilson. Any questions of the deputy? Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Corey Branch. Good morning, uh, Mr. Branch. Uh, you have three minutes and you're most welcome here. Morning, good morning, uh, Council, morning, Mayor. My name is Corey Branch, lifelong Scarborough resident. I'm also a transit worker on behalf of the TTC, streetcar mechanic. So as far as Scarborough is concerned, as Scarborough Transit is concerned, I'm seeing things from both sides of the spectrum. So with that being said, as a Scarborough resident, the word neglect is often used to describe the transition, transit situation in Scarborough over the past 20 years. Personally, I view it as a cruel game of keep away with the Ford government and the PCs in, as the root of the problem. Case in point being, in the Eglinton subway in the mid 90s, we had a uh, plan ready to go and it was, the, it was canceled by Mike Harris government. Forward, forward again, we have Transit City, fully funded, ready to go in development, would have been up and running today if it hadn't been stopped by the Ford brothers. Here we are again now, 2019, Eglinton East LRT, a plan that could reach a properly dense, dense area in, Marvin, in Malvern, ready to go, early stages of development, and here we are. It's not a priority of the, of the Ford government. It's being paused. So the, I feel is the time to move forward is now on such projects as such as the Eglinton East LRT. It's the most efficient way to reach a service, uh, reach an area that's currently being held together by a bus network. In the two letters that were delivered by the PC government with the four priority projects, should be, red, uh, should be a red flag for the city. They show that those who warned us about the potential to upload and the cause of delays it would cause and the loss of control over transit, plan, transit planning was right. I would advise the city to stick to its own plans 
and priorities and to keep the Eglinton East LRT on the front burner. It's important to the people of Scarborough that the city move ahead with planning engineering of the whole Eglinton East LRT project to Malvern Center, not just phase one. Phasing always, always carries the danger that it could be knocked off the agenda by political pressure. Look at the uh, record so far. Records show us that the Eglinton East LRT and other LRT projects should be built as publicly owned, operated, funded, and maintained lines as part of the public project, public uh, private partnership, or P3 as we call it. And on, the, on the Metrolinx project, the Eglinton Crosstown had a 30 year maintenance contract that's been handled, has been uh, signed over to Bombardier. The second red flag about the, the upload strategy the city should be taking very seriously is the province says that it plans to assume responsibility for subway infrastructure, including the building and maintenance of new and existing subway lines. Based on their record, Metrolinx will sell off the subway uh, maintenance to a private company like SNC Lavin, like Bombardier. When we look at the past records in Canada and around the world, having the private sector run and maintain transit lines has been nothing short of disaster. The meth is filled in Australia, it's filled in the UK. Now we have companies such as Bombardier who can't deliver a city a quality vehicle nor a streetcar on time. It's one thing to build the transit line, but if the, if the maintenance is subpar, then the result will create a losing scenario for Scarborough and other areas of Toronto. If I could ask you to conclude now, thank you. Yep. Any questions I'll take? Oh, you're, you're done. Okay, thanks so much. Are there any questions of the Deputy Councillor McKelvey? Hi, thank you. Um, I believe you live in Scarborough Rouge Park. I do. And you live in the southern portion of the ward? I do. Do you think that the south of the ward would like to be connected with the north through the extension Absolutely. through to Absolutely. I Malvern? think the, the plan with the Eglinton East LRT should be to connect the whole loop, not just so we complete the circle. So it makes it easier for residents to travel around. It makes it easier to get to work. It makes it, it creates economic development, just as the previous speakers were were endorsing. So I think that's the best plan to go around. I also believe it's the best plan that we advise the province that operations and maintenance should stay within the city of Toronto because we have the best track record for it. Right. So when you look at the track record of previous uh, example, take for example Bombardier, the issues we're having right now with streetcar, and they have the Eglinton Crosstown. The report came out last week uh, through the Star, Toronto Star, I believe, saying that on a 35 uh, kilometer expectation, they're only hitting seven and a half. And this is a brand new vehicle. On the flip side of that, our older vehicles, which we call the CLRVs, are only aver are averaging four and a half miles per breakdown. So we have a, a gap here where we have a brand new vehicle barely performing better than an aging fleet that's about to hit 40 years old. So these are the questions I would ask is, would you want something like this applied not only for our streetcar fleet, Eglinton Crosstown, but would you apply that same method to the Eglinton East LRT? Where's the consistency and standards? So the recommendation I would say is for the city of Toronto to keep the work with the, us, because we have the better track record, we have the better for reputation for it, award-winning service. And, but you do think that we should build straight out to Melbourne, because you are worried that when we phase projects, those phase extensions Absolutely. don't get built. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor McKelvey. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, Participation, Mr. Branch, yep. uh, and we come next to Franklin McFadden. Not, not here. Well, we'll we'll stand that. Is he is he still coming or uh, no? Okay. Well, I'm sorry about that. Did, did he write a letter by chance? No. He. All right. That's fine. Thanks so much for letting us know that. Uh, Sithersana Srithas. Good morning. Thanks for coming today, and you have three minutes. Hello, members of the council and mayor Tory and city staff. My name is Siddharth Sinasridas, president of the Scarborough Community Renewal Organization, an organization committed to creating and realizing bold visions to renew Scarborough. Today, I'm here to speak in support of the Eglinton East LRT to Malvern. After reviewing the staff report on Toronto's transit expansion program, we are supportive and pleased with the city's commitment to investing in Scarborough Transit through the extension of the Eglinton East LRT to Scarborough Town Centre and the University of Toronto Scarborough ca campus. However, the lack of funding and phasing of the remaining portion of the Eglinton East LRT to Malvern Centre is concerning. For the past 40 years, Scarborough has been and continues to be greatly underserved when it comes to transit. Better transit is essential to the marginalized, precarious workforce living in eastern Scarborough and especially in Melbourne, who have unreasonably long commute times to jobs in the inner city. And improved public transit is a catalyst to economic development as we're starting to see in Golden Mine. 
Previous administrations have promised to build high order transit in Scarborough back in 2010, but that was never delivered. I do want to recognize the work, planning, and the consultant, uh, consultations that have taken place to date, but the phasing of the Eglinton East LRT extension shows a lack of commitment both from the council and staff. We have seen what happens to Scarborough Transit projects when they get phased. They often don't get built or they get left out. If the motion passes as is, it'll be decades before um, LRT, uh, we see an LRT east of Kennedy Station. Therefore, SCO asks that you move forward with the approval for funding for the Eglinton East LRT up to and including Malvern without any phasing of the project. These trans investments are critical in, imp in improving the lives of residents of Scarborough, connecting us to communities within Scarborough and to the rest of the city. Thank you very much. Half time. That's uh, very good. Uh, is there a question for this deputy, uh, Councillor Ainsley? Good morning. Thanks for coming in this morning. Um, I just wanted to ask, so right now the report says uh, the Eglinton East LRT, we're going to do one phase to U of T Scarborough, uh, second phase to Malvern. Both of them are unfunded. And if we do it in one phase, we've changed the scope, we're making it more complicated. We're depending on the, the Shepherd LRT to be built, which is even lower in priority than the first phase. So do you think that students at U of T Scarborough uh, will be happy waiting even longer for an LRT to get to the campus? I if, we, if we do it all in one shot as opposed to phase one, which is projected to go to the campus? Uh, well, I'm, I know there's members of the University of Toronto's campus here today to speak on their experiences, but as a previous uh, student, um, I do think waiting a little bit longer with the strong commitment that there will be one to Scarborough campus and Malvern in one go. Um, there are a significant number of students coming from Malvern who would benefit from a uh, uh, higher order transit, like an LRT connecting to the campus um, if it's at Malvern Town Centre as well. Okay, so when you say wait a bit longer, you, under, you understand, or I don't know if this, I can ask the students, so that, that wait, because we're doing it all in one phase where we don't have any money for it, it could be anywhere from five to ten years longer. I think I, I do not want to compromise for a connected network. I do, uh, for less than a connected network, I think it's important to have a straight line to Malvern in the first phase. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Tory. Thanks, Councillor Ainsley. Uh, any other questions for Ms. Rivas? No. Thanks so much for your uh, deputation. Uh, David Matter. Mr. Matter, good morning. Thank morning, you for coming. Uh, you have three minutes, and then there may be some questions. Morning, John Tory, uh, members of Council. My name is Dave Matter. I've been a resident of Scarborough since 1951. That's 68 years. Um, right now, I'm a, a member of Residents Rising and also a volunteer with uh, Scarborough Transit Action. Uh, as you know, Scarborough has been waiting for about 40 years for better transit. In 1969, the first plan, the city designated a route to Scarborough North and full circle along Finch Avenue West for the completion of this project. So they had a circle uh, project then that ran around all of Scarborough. Now we're looking at the same plan today. So this was in 1969. And there's a car copy on the archives. I have a copy of that. Um, in 1980, the Kennedy Station was built and then the RT in 1985. The plans for subways and LRTs have not been funded to this date. In 2009, a plan was brought forward and not funded. Uh, with a new upgraded plan that we have before us today, 2019, is pretty well the same plan. It's an upgraded plan, but the same plan that I have in my folder right here from 2009. Um, it is an investment for Toronto and Scarborough East. This project will identify planning priorities along this transit corridor. This plan would enhance public spaces, streetscape, and focus areas. This network would be good for redevelopment opportunities as well as social and economic development. The Eglinton East LRT would bring a much-needed transit network to Scarborough. 
and July 2016, item EX 16.1 was passed and directed staff to identify the alignment and next steps for an extension to Malvern. This is still in the works. In 2016, the Eglinton East LRT was revived from the Crosstown East and in 2017 was changed to the Eglinton East LRT with completion date of 2023. An announcement was made by John Torrey in May of 2018 promising residents in Scarborough that the project will move ahead sooner than later. Before the election in 2018, information on funding was changed from the current plan and the cost was upgraded. With the recent announcements with the current Ford government about transit priorities, the priorities have changed, excluding the Eglinton East LRT. I call on all council members and Mayor John Tory to approve and secure <clears throat> funding for this plan. Uh, on that note, sir, I'll have to ask you to conclude because we're just at uh, 3.30. So we'll leave it at that and see if there's a question for you. Anybody have any questions for this uh, gentleman, Mr. Matter? Thank you, Mr. Matter, very much. We appreciate your attendance. Uh, Nicole Briannis. Briannis. Hello, I will be speaking with Hannah Sayad, who was the next speaker on the list, but we'll be doing it together, so. All right, and we'll give you some, a uh, little bit of leeway on that, so because you're actually theoretically entitled to more than the three minutes between the two. So you can go ahead, and if you use less, there'll be a, a bonus commendation coming from that. But you're most welcome, both of you, and please go ahead. <laughs> Sounds great. So good morning, Mayor John Tory and committee members. My name is Nicole Briannis, and I'm a psychology co-op student and sociology minor at the University of Toronto Scarborough, as well as the president of the Scarborough Campus Students' Union. My name is Hannah Syed, and I am a student studying neuroscience and psychology, and I currently serve as a vice president external at the SCSU. During my term, we've collaborated with a number of transit advocacy organizations, the TTC, TTC stakeholders, um, and ensuring that there are enough student and public consultations, including an upcoming transit town hall that we'll be hosting this Wednesday, where Mayor John Tory will be attending, and we'll be having Councillor McKelvey as well as Councillor Ainley speaking. Um, and we do encourage other city councillors to come out to it as well to hear what constituents want um, as we've been encouraging and ensuring that Torontonians can have um, connections with the city and the city's transit plans. So we are here on behalf of the 14,000 undergraduate students at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. We are also joined here today by a number of students from our campus to urge members of the executive committee to prioritize the Eglinton East LRT which we will hear forward um, say as the EE LRT. The majority of students, myself included, at UTSC depend on public transit, and more specifically the TTC, to get to and from home, work, and school. We are deeply concerned that the Eglinton East LRT is being put at risk by the province's plan to take over our city's transit system. We urge the mayor and the executive committee to defend the Eglinton East LRT and to ensure that it reaches UTSC and Malvern. Although it is clear that only the subway extension is being named as a priority, we are here to emphasize that our members need more than just a connection to the downtown core. As over 22% of all Scarborough riders use transit exclusively to move within Scarborough, it is essential that our city prioritizes these riders through the EELRT and provide them with the transit and access they deserve. So students at UTSC have continued to be a valuable partner for the Toronto City Council. When the body needed support to fund the Pan Am Sports Center, you came to students and we covered the balance. During those negotiations, we were promised that this, would, that this new center would pave the way for enhanced transit infrastructure, and so we agreed to chip in and support with money out of our own pockets, which as you know is lacking. Now that we are asking you to uphold your end of the bargain and to support our community, we are met with excuses of why it can't be done. The Eglinton East LRT was first promised to be built in 2015, yet here we are in 2019 and the project has not even been started. We question what kind of message does this send to the communities that live and work and study in Scarborough? For us, the EELRT is fundamentally a conversation about safety and access, despite what was said earlier in the previous presentation. This expansion project would help connect students and community members to safer and more affordable housing options. 
Currently, the lack of transit connections forces many of our student members, especially international students, into unregular, unregulated rooming houses where their safety is at risk. Students from marginalized communities, including women, Muslim folks, queer, and trans students, have reported fearing for their safety on their commutes home. They are forced to wait unprotected and exposed at bus stops for transfers, often without shelter or lights, and sometimes for upwards of 30 minutes. The Eglinton East LRT is also a means to ensure better access to education. Studies have shown a direct correlation between the time that students spend commuting on transit and their success in post-secondary education. When students don't have adequate access to reliable transit, it impacts our academic success and our ability to engage in extracurricular activities. Investing in the Eglinton East LRT would be an investment in education and success for the next generation. For these reasons, we are disappointed in the Executive Committee's consideration to cut the Eglinton East LRT expansion to um, exclude Melbourne. It is both an unfortunate and clear demonstration that this council lacks value for neighborhoods in Scarborough. With threats to interfere on transit matters from the provincial government, we need you to become advocates for Scarborough communities and demand that the Eglinton East LRT in its full form be creative, created. This project is long overdue and it is crucial that Scarborough community members receive the respect and the consideration they deserve through the full Eglinton East LRT expansion from Kennedy to Malvern. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the deputation, both of you. Uh, are there questions of these deputants? Uh, uh, Councillor Ainsley. Sorry. Good morning, ladies. Thank you for coming in this morning. I just wanted, so what we have before us today is a report, so phase one, uh, the LRT to U of T Scarborough, which I fully support. The next, next part is phasing it. Um, to Malvern, which I also fully support because I think it should be integrated all the way to Malvern. The difficulty we have is money. Um, we're still looking for money for the first phase, let alone the second phase. Um, so if we change the recommendations today to do it all in one phase, uh, changing the scope and the, 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 the design work we have to do. So it could de delay the LRT going even for longer to UTSC, probably five to 10 years. Would the students at UTSC be comfortable with that? So um, we've done a lot of student consultations and research around this as well. Um, currently, we do have the 905 bus that travels from UTSC to Kennedy Station. That was formerly uh, the 198 bus. However, it was um, improved, but we're seeing that there still is a lack of services and it's not as fast and efficient as we would like it to be. And so something like the Eglinton East LRT would significantly improve that. Um, so I would say that uh, these delays in the larger uh, in the grand scheme of things would be all right if in the meantime we're able to improve these bus services for students to still be able to get better connected from UTSC down to Kennedy as well as um, ensuring that in the end we will have the Eglantini Stellar T so that all of it can be as rapid um, and as efficient as possible. And we think it's essential that this does go to Melbourne. Um, we, as Hannah was saying, um, if we're able to find the connection and improve the express bus that we currently have en route to Kennedy, that'll be sufficient for UTSC in the short term. Um, and it's very essential that we connect all the way to Melbourne because otherwise we'll be excluding a huge portion of Scarborough, recognizing, as we said as well for our students, it's access to affordable housing and to work within the Scarborough community. UTSC is one of the largest commuting schools, um, and our students, we want to be able to have them have access for folks who already live in Malvern that will be commuting to UTSC as we will have students speaking um, a little later today as well on their experiences in terms of how long transit actually takes within Scarborough as it stands. So our priority is not only getting folks to the downtown through access to Kennedy from UTSC, it is actually connecting all of Scarborough, um, which would include Malvern in this long-term um, expansion project. Okay, I'm sorry, just on a side note, what's, what's the issue with the 905 bus service? <laughs> that's been a long time. It's supposed to be an express bus that's... It's not an express bus. So there bus. are way too many stops on it, but it doesn't seem to be an express bus. So it's okay. been expressed on multiple accounts um, from students in consultation that the express bus should be just at major intersections, stopping at Centennial School as well, in order to include them on the route. Um, but as it stands, there is... If you take it, it takes at least yeah, 35 minutes, mm -hmm. I think, 40 minutes to get to Kennedy Station using the bus. Really? Okay. So. I will have to take it and try it, but I will take your Please word do. for it and I'll look into it's it. It's also very, very packed, so that's another concern as well, that more buses on the route would be a huge benefit with that. Okay. So. I will, you have my word, I will look into that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Tori. 
Any other questions? I just will ask you a couple, just following up on what Councillor Ainsley was just asking about, and I too will come and have a look. But uh, what about capacity on that bus? I mean, I hear loud and clear that it's taking too long because there are too many stops. What about capacity? I mean, meaning is it full? Is it half full? Is it You can uh, barely empty? get on most times. If you're taking it from Kennedy to get to school, especially at the Kennedy loading station, you have to wait usually at least one bus before you can get on if you're not there waiting at least 10 minutes in advance. Oh. So it's highly, highly overcapacitated en route, especially during rush hour time. Um, it's the largest area of concern, but definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. I should know the answer to this question too. I just don't. Uh, is it, is, do you, because it's an express bus, we have different categorizations of express bus. Do you have to pay an extra fare for it or is it regular fare? It's all concluded in your fare. Yeah. So it's okay. Still, so you don't have to. That's okay. Well, that's helpful to know. And I'll follow up with the Councillor McKelvey and Councillor Ainsley and we'll see about that because it just doesn't make sense to have for the present time and whatever route we choose to build. Uh, and I think there's going to be lots of discussion today about the Chabar East LRT. Uh, it's going to take time in any event and we should be fixing uh, things that are not adequate in the meantime. So thank you very much for that. Thank All right. Thanks so much for your deputation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kandil Imran, University of Toronto Scarborough student. Welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Tory and members of the Executive Committee. My name is Kandil Imran and I'm a student at the University of Toronto Scarborough studying city studies, public policy and critical migration studies. I would like to Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Today, I'm here to speak about the Eglinton East LRT, as well as the need for enhanced bus routes in Scarborough, especially connecting to Markham, which is where I reside. I have three main concerns. I urge you to put the Eglinton East LRT back on the city's list of priority transit infrastructure projects, explore options for more enhanced bus routes in Scarborough, and discuss integrating transit networks with neighboring municipalities. Some background on me. I don't have a car or a driver's license, so I rely on the TTC to get to UTSC, where I both study and work a job on campus. I live only 12 kilometers away from campus, so driving would take me maybe 20 minutes or less, but the TTC takes one whole hour. I take the 102D Markham Road bus south to Ellesmere, then take either the 95 or the 38 route east to UTSC. I chose the campus closest to my home, but I still can't get there because of how inadequate the transit infrastructure in Scarborough is. The fact that it takes me so long to get where I need to go is impacting my success as a student and my ability to engage fully in academic life. For me, transit is the main reason that makes me late or even miss my classes. The 102D bus only comes every 30 to 40 minutes which means being a couple minutes late or early to that bus stop is a matter of getting to class or not getting to class. Transit also determines what classes I can take depending on the times they're offered. If they're too early or too late at night, it makes my journey that much more difficult. I have faced gendered Islamophobia when standing at bus stops for prolonged periods of time at night because the bus just wouldn't come. And after spending entire days on campus, the ride home tires me out so much that it has led to burnout. I say all this to emphasize that simply living three kilometers north of Steeles should not mean that I have such limited access to transit. The Greater Toronto Area should be what it says in the name, connected across municipal lines through collaboration in city planning with neighboring municipalities. The Eglinton East LRT, in conjunction with the Shepherd East LRT, would help me get to campus much faster. With an LRT network, it would free up more buses to put into a frequent and enhanced bus network, and being able to take an express bus or BRT from my home to Markham Road and Shepherd, hopping onto the Shepherd LRT that connects to the Eglinton LRT, East LRT would completely change my commute. It would also help me and my mom, who works with home child cares in Malvern in, and Scarborough Southwest to easily get around within Scarborough. In conclusion, the city needs to create a rapid transit network in Scarborough. I'm asking for the Eglinton East LRT and Shepherd East LRT to be built as the foundations of an integrated network of rapid transit in Scarborough with connections to enhanced bus routes into Markham and Pickering. I believe that this will help transit riders in Scarborough and those who reside on the borderlines of neighboring municipalities, people like me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you for taking the opportunity and we'll see if there's any questions for you. And we have Councillor Carroll with a question. 
Uh, yes, thank you so much for your uh, deputation. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sorry, those, the, those lines should both be well under construction and nearing completion. I'm sorry for the, the past. Um, uh, but but I, I'm interested because you, you bring into focus the, the Shepherd LRT. And uh, that one has a, 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 a weird future because it, at, upon its cancellation, it reverted over to Metrolink. So I'm wondering, um, have you considered having any conversation uh, about the, the really the whole LRT network you talk about serving Scarborough with your provincial MPP because I think I think it's interesting that you actually live north of Steeles and yet that would serve you so well mm -hmm. yeah have um, you considered talking to your MPP yeah um, well I did get to talk to uh, the MPP of um, uh, the UTSC riding which is right MPP Vijay, but I, I do uh, want to go and talk to MPP Logan, who is my... Uh, uh, right, right, right. Um, do, do you know if they... they uh, uh, is it discussed amongst... Uh, north of, north of Steeles, I, I, I'm not aware, are the MPPs actually discussing how the network immediately south in Scarborough would serve their residents? Because you're a perfect example. Of course, our students are coming from all mm -hmm. over. Um, well, I'm not sure. Like, I, I haven't seen those conversations happening. Um, uh, of course, we've seen uh, conversations about Smart Track connecting to Unionville, but yeah. that east, sort of southeast portion of Markham really yeah. just gets neglected in a lot of ways, and it actually is the, has pockets of poverty and um, uh, is, is probably the priority neighborhood of Markham. So yes, yes. Yeah. Well, we'll try to help with those conversations in any way we can. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Councillor Carroll. Uh, other questions of the deputant? All right, well, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Much appreciated. Uh, Hannah Kassim. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming, and you have three minutes. All right, thank you. Good morning, Mayor Tory and Executive Committee. My name is Hannah Kassim, and I'm a graduating City Studies student at the University of Toronto Scarborough. I'm also an active community member with knowledge and interests on urban transportation systems. I'm speaking today to support the prioritization of the Eglinton East LRT Scarborough Extension to UTSC and Melbourne. As you already know and have heard today, there are many positive aspects to building the Eglinton East LRT. But today I'll be focusing on one aspect, that is how the Scarborough Extension will positively affect students' quality of education. Based on mine and my colleagues' experiences, many students do not go to class because their commute is very long or complicated, which ultimately affects their grades, attendance, and overall attendance at school. For example, I used to live 20 minutes away from school, taking the bus, and enjoyed visiting campus often to attend and plan events, be with friends, and most importantly, attend my classes. However, last September, I moved further away from campus, and now it takes me at least an hour and a half to get to school. Since this change, I found myself less motivated to go to school and ended up missing a lot of classes. I can honestly say that the quality of my education this past year has been significantly lower than the first three years at UTSC. Although the LRT won't directly affect my commute to school, I can sympathize and imagine the ways in which it will enrich the lives of many students at UTSC and other uh, educational institutions in Scarborough. I'd also like to mention um, Professor Stephen Farber's research, an assistant professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus, who is well versed in transportation geography and also has spoken on this issue claiming that the time students take to commute to campus can seriously impact their quality uh, of education. He explains that many students choose courses in a way to reduce the number of days they need to come to campus, which means they may be missing out on courses that they are truly interested in, which ultimately affects educational outcomes. He too pushes the fact that improving quality of life should be a major goal for transit in Scarborough. We can definitely do this through the, through the Eglinton East LRT, a Scarborough extension, by making Scarborough more accessible. Education is a stepping st stone to success, so let's lead prosperous futures through e efficient transit in Scarborough. I hope that Council will uh, consider how the Eglinton East LRT Scarborough Extension will increase the quality of education for thousands of students in Scarborough when deciding on a vote. Thank you for this opportunity to speak in front of you, and I look forward to observing your votes in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions of the Deputy Councillor Carroll? 
Uh, yes, I'm wondering, because I know you've uh, been here for the morning, if, uh, if hearing the other deputies who have any comments, number of the deputations that we've had where, where we're talking about Scarborough U of T campus, um, while they're looking for that focus on the extension, they, they seem to, to also be understanding that in, term, in terms of making a network of transit through, uh, through Scarborough, it means an LRT network. And, and so they, they're proposing such things as the Scarborough subway should have perhaps been an LRT, that Shepherd should continue as an LRT. Mm -hmm. So that you have not only your extension, but a loop that will get you to the campus or beyond. Uh, do, you have, do you have any uh, opinion on those in, in conjunction with what you're asking for? Yeah, I definitely think we need to look at all the projects together and um, focus on having connectivity within the city. Um, like as er earlier, um, deputants were talking about how most people in Scarborough travel within Scarborough. So I'd like to have that connectivity between all the transit routes, not just the Eglinton piece. Right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further questions of the deputy? Thanks again uh, very much for coming. Uh, Annie Sahagian, University of Toronto, Scarborough campus. Good morning. You're welcome here and you have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Tory and the Executive Committee and everyone who is present with us today. Uh, my name is Annie Sahagian. I am a student at the University of Toronto, Scarborough campus and a resident and active member from the Scarborough Centre region. I'm here as I wanted to speak about the importance of the Eglinton East light rail transit for me. As a newcomer to Canada who lives on Eglinton Avenue East for the past three years, I have relied on the Toronto Transit Commission TTC to commute to UTSC. The Eglinton Avenue bus number 34 is non-reliable as it never comes at its scheduled times. Furthermore, the Scarborough Express Network bus 905 is a bus that runs every eight minutes from Kennedy to UTSC. During peak rush hours, the 905 bus is not able to serve students like me to quickly commute to a UTSC. My commute to campus takes me 40 to 45 minutes while the Eglinton East Light Rail Transit can cut this time in half. Now, you're probably asking, okay then, just enrolling classes that are not during rush hour. Well, there are certain classes that are only offered during specific times, and my dependence on the TTC affects me to enroll myself in classes uh, to try and avoid rush hours as much as possible. This leaves me in a situation where instead of TTC, creating an environment where my education experience can thrive, it acts as a barrier for me by making me enroll in classes not based on content, but when they are offered. This is important because UTSC has currently 14,000 students who are mostly commuters to campus. Therefore, the City of Toronto needs to cater to the growing transportation needs of the Scarborough community and because youth are the future of our city. We need to make their education experience as effective and enjoyable as possible. This will help transit riders in Scarborough not to depend on one bus, such as the 905 Express bus to commute to East Scarborough, but have a faster transportation means such as the Eglinton East LRT that will enhance the commuting experience of the Scarborough Transit riders. Thank you for the opportunity that allowed me to speak today about the Eglinton East LRT and I welcome any questions regarding my commuting experience for the past three years to and from campus and have a great day everyone. Thank you very much for the deputation. Uh, and are there questions of the deputy? Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Your presentation's been uh, quite effective. Uh, I'm just wondering, so is this the first opportunity you've had to speak to this issue? Uh, in front of the City of Toronto. I'm just wondering, for example, have you reported to the TTC with respect to the lateness of the buses and or the fact that um, they're all quite full when they arrive at the location. And have you done that? And uh, did you get a response? Thank you, very good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, actually, uh, the so the 905 bus used to be called the 198 bus, right. and it used to run every 10 minutes. However, the efforts of the Scarborough Campus Students Union uh, in lobbying the TTC has made the 10 minutes to eight minutes. Mm -hmm. That's why, yes, we have been speaking about this issue, with to our uh, vice president external and president of our Scarborough Campus Students Union for them to effectively lobby the TTC and thus we have seen uh, like instead of a 10 minutes 
elimination of that 10 minutes to eight minutes. Right. However, it's still, so the conversation has been initiated, yes, but there's much more uh, conversations to be developed and improved, such as the, this, the, I mean, the Eglinton East Light Rail Transit. Right, now, and, I, and, I, and I get that, and I understand your explanation. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is that in the interest of time, because the LRT is not going to happen for quite some time, irrespective of what we do here today, I'm just wondering um, in terms of looking to facilitate perhaps more additional uh, equipment to be online to provide the service. So whether or now it's, it's eight minutes, uh, but also it is a busy um, uh, bus that's normally full. I think that's kind of what I'm hearing you're saying. Yes. So there is a real need to have further review and to look at what additional assets could be added because of the capacity issue. Would you agree? Yes, so if you mean that till the time that the Eglinton East LRT ha will be built, right. yes, we do need to make the bus more accessible and more frequent right. to serve more students because the 905 does not only serve students, it, it serves Scarborough sure. riders who yes. also commute to East Scarborough. That's why, yes, I do think that till the time period that we get the SLRT to be in place, we need to have uh, conversations regarding what we can do to make the service faster. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Ms. Warren. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions for the deputy? Thanks again for being with us. Appreciate Thank you it. so much. Uh, Lucas Granger. Lucas Granger. There we are. Perfect. We welcome you here this morning and you have three minutes and there may be some questions for you. All right, uh, thank you very much. My name is Lucas Granger, uh, and I am a student at the University of Toronto St. George, and I am the incoming Vice President External for the University of Toronto Students Union as of May 1st. Um, I am a longtime resident of Melbourne. I love my community deeply, and I care about being involved in the city that we all know and love. Um, as I was growing up, I had a lot of people surrounding me who, who said post-amalgamation that Scarborough was forgotten that we have been neglected and so on and so forth with every issue you can think of. Uh, I never understood until I moved downtown. Uh, I find it hard to get home. I find it hard to visit my family. I find it hard to work and live and study and manage my personal life due to the fact that it takes me from campus over an hour to get home to Scarborough. It takes me less time to get to Oshawa. Uh, the Eglinton East Light Rail Transit Project needs to be a priority for the city because every day and every year and every minute that we delay is another minute that we do not have access to the entirety of our city and the inaccessibility of Scarborough to the rest of the city. Our communities are vibrant, our businesses are successful, and our educational facilities are some of the best in the world. The city and the mayor have made a promise to Scarborough to provide us with a robust and reliable network of rapid transportation whether that be the Shepherd East or the Eglinton East LRTs, as well as the potential Scarborough subway. Uh, that is another conversation. We need an entire network to, complete, to be completed in order to fully be part of the city, and the Eglinton East project is a crucial and necessary step towards this. This project, as stated in uh, Appendix 4, uh, is expected to bring close to 50,000 people within walking distance, walking distance of reliable rapid transit. These communities need service. They have been forgotten for far, far too long, and these projections will only grow with time as Scarborough develops further. Uh, additionally, as a student downtown, I know how difficult it is for us to travel back and forth. Uh, as my colleagues from the SCSU have mentioned, they experience their own issues commuting into Scarborough themselves. However, a, a conversation that needs to be had is that uh, students in general also commute between the campuses. So we have a dedicated shuttle that brings us to the University of Toronto Mississauga, but because Scarborough is in the city of Toronto, we are expected to use the TTC, which experiences frequent delays and frequent service interruptions, and we are expected to be in a class within an hour sometimes. That's impossible if anyone actually commutes here. So um, I will leave you with that. Um, I don't want to see our community suffer from indecision and concentrating of plans. You have to remember that we need this too above the 401. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Ms. Granger. Questions of the deputy? Uh, Councilor McGalvey, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Sorry. So the U of T gives you one hour to get to class. Is that 
So as I hear you right. Uh, yeah. So sometimes uh, classes uh, we must take are with they are set with certain times. Right. Uh, and a lot of students do take classes at different campuses. While UTM has a shuttle that takes around 40 minutes. Right. UTSC does not have anything of the sort. And the actual commute, because I do that commute, I live very close to campus, yeah. it's about an hour and 15, it, right? it takes about an hour and 15. About an so hour. we either walk in late or we don't go at all. Okay, and you think that the Eglinton East LRT could give you considerable more reliability in transit in, in the area? Yeah, I think the reliability aspect is, is really crucial because at least with the LRT, we know it would have a dedicated right away. We know that it would have dedicated service. Okay. Um, and I think that if the city wants to proceed further with any discussions on this, they should have a dedicated task force meeting with the SCSU and the UTSU to discuss student issues on this project because it's not just residents of Melbourne and the rest of Scarborough, it's students from across the city, across the, across the, the GTA. And you fully support though extending into Melbourne so that we connect the Completely. transit network and connect the loop? It, it needs to all happen at once because you can't, like with the phasing, I disagree with the assertion that it would take longer because if we ignore a certain section it, we can just clap our hands and say, oh, we're done, we've done our job. But you, you can't say that when the job is only half complete. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, no worries. Thanks, uh, Councilor McKel uh, McKelvey. Any other questions? All right, well, Mr. Granger, well, thank you very much for your deputation and for being here today. Uh, I believe that brings us to the end of the deputations and the people who registered by 1030. And so if that's so, uh, we can move to questions of staff and ask uh, our city manager and his associates to go back to the table, whoever's going to appear there. Are you going by yourself? <laughs> well, well, the answer to that is yes, you're going. But uh, it's only a question of who else you invite to join you. I think it's just easier to have you up there because then people can see where the answers are coming from. And Okay, uh, thank you for coming back up and for the presentation earlier on. And uh, I am uh, looking for members of council who are visiting with us today who are not on the executive committee, starting with Councillor McKelvey to ask questions of staff. Thank you, Mayor Tory. Uh, so my questions relate to the Eglinton East LRT and uh, this phasing. Uh, so firstly, I just wanna confirm, so in May, 2018, Council approved an alignment along Military Trail as well as an extension to Melbourne with six stops, is that correct? Through the chair, that is correct. Okay. Um, and then since that time, you've undertaken more study, and then it looks like you met with the University of Toronto on March 28th um, to tell them your preferred alignment? Through the chair, uh, yes, we have undertaken more detailed analysis and met with the university most recently at the end of March, but throughout the project. And so I'm reading through their extensive comments, um, which they had prepared by a third party review. Um, and in there, it, it mentions that now um, the preferred alignment would stop at military and Ellesmere and it wouldn't go to the Pan Am Center. Has, is that still the case? Through the, uh, through the chair, part of what we, are, we talked to them about was ways that we may optimize the plan. That is not what is recommended at this stage. We've acknowledged in the report that there is some additional work that needs to be done, but that was a concept that we floated with them at the end of March, yes. And were they favourable to that concept? They had some concerns with that concept, as you see in the letter before you. So the Pan Am facility, it's a, it's a major you know, tourist attraction for Scarborough. It would make sense that the Eggleston East LRT stops there. Uh, through the chair, we were not suggesting there not be a stop there. This had to do with how we might deal with the phasing and the extension from Malvern down through the campus. So, so there would still be a stop there and, and that is still a, a possibility. So the stop at the Toronto Pan Am Centre would be part of phase two? Uh, that is a possibility through uh, optimizing the plan as something that we would need to think of, depending on the direction that we get from Council. But this was some initial thinking that we floated with the University and still need to work through the details. Um, so looking through their, uh, their extensive comments, they, they have some additional um, concerns about how the Eglinton East LRT would be moving through campus and how that fits with their secondary plan. So since you're meeting with them on March 28th, have those been addressed? 
we have, uh, we have, over the course of this project, talked to them about the way in which the LRTs would be moving through the campus. We have not fully addressed all of the questions that they have raised in the letter, but we'll be continuing to work with them as we advance this project. Um, because the other main concern is, I say, they say here, quote, that the proposed alignment would constitute a further taking of UTSE lands in impact development potential adjacent to the Toronto Pan Am Aquatic Centre. So I know U of T has a really extensive plan for building a conference centre, a hotel, potentially the arts centre, and that would be an ideal location beside the Pan Am Centre, because that's where people are going when they visit that area. Final question. Through the chair, um, Councillor, I think they're referring to uh, the potential connection to the maintenance and storage facility. We did we did talk to them about that. They had some concerns and, and indicated to them we're certainly open uh, to uh, discussing with them further, waiting for their feedback on where exactly the uh, the best place to uh, access the potential maintenance and storage facility would be. We have. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Councillor McKelvey. Other members of council in attendance, Joe, uh, Councillor Joe Cressy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll direct my questions to the city manager as he sees fit on funding priorities. So as I s understand it, uh, under our PTIF 2 funding outlined in here, the DRL, um, the Scarborough uh, subway, Smart Track, and the Young Bluer fix to address overcrowding. Those are the four requests for funding priorities. Through the mayor, that's correct. Okay. So. Then looking to the next phase, when I look at page five of the status of transit ex expansion projects, what are the next priorities as identified by staff uh, in order of priority? So I understand DRL, Scarborough One su Stop Subway, Smart Track, and Young Blue are crowding. Of the Waterfront East and West LRT, the Eglinton East and West LRT, uh, capacity issues, what are the next priorities in order? So if I can, through the mayor, um, we're, we have not specified a first, second, third, fourth in terms of that list of projects that you just mentioned. So uh, what we've done here, obviously, is ensured that the, you know, the 4.897 billion, which is the cap that uh, the federal government is offering for transit, is fully utilized. The remainder of projects, uh, we are not recommending a, a specific order to that. We have not applied a if you will, a, a socioeconomic justice lens to those projects to determine uh, which ones might uh, rank in that uh, kind of first, second, third approach. So which are the projects that could be, which are the p projects in the running to be in that top tier list? Because we have many projects. Uh, as I look at this gate funding decision two, I see Eglinton East LRT, Eglinton West LRT, Waterfront Queens Key East. So. That's what I see as the next gate two. So do I then surmise from that that we will in the future have to determine of those three which are, which are the priorities? Yep. Through the mayor, uh, that's correct. So if I can, to the TTC, from, a, from an expansion point of view, transit expansion, which lines hold the greatest capacity? Uh, through the chair. Per dollar. Which lines per dollar hold the greatest capacity from an expansion point of view? Uh, through, the, through the chair. We haven't done that specific analysis. From a ridership point of view, uh, dealing with the capacity issues on line one is our highest priority. Okay. And of the other projects, uh, there are varying ridership projections for them. Eglinton East is very high and Waterfront is very high as well. Okay. So what is the report back timeline then, I guess, to you, Mr. City Manager? What is the expected report back timeline on the next phase of priorities and funding, understanding that we're really boiling down to Eglinton and Waterfront here? So if I can, through the Mayor, I think we indicated in our presentation um, that we are, and as well in the report, that we are aiming to come back with a report in the fall prior to the 2020 budget. Okay. Um, with prioritization? Um, that would be reasonable. Okay. Um, and then I guess my second line of questioning with my 40 seconds here, the PTIF funding model that you described at 40% from the feds, a minimum 33% from the province and 27% from the city. If the province announces that they are no longer interested in funding our four, what happens to the federal dollars? 
So the four projects were asking for PTIP2 funding, DRL, Scarborough One Stop, Smart Track, Young Bluer, Crowding. If the province announces that they are not interested in funding any of those four, what happens to the 40% from the feds? Uh, through the mayor, I think our first step, if that were in fact the yeah. case, I mean, we'd be reporting back. Uh, in fact, I think we have an opportunity as of Thursday, we'll know what the budget is, we'll have some clarity as to how the federal government or provincial government sees allocating money. I would. I would probably give you a more fulsome answer at council when this matter comes forward. But can I ask with my last question, is the federal 40% tied to provincial funding for them or does the legally or contractually, is the 40% tied to provincial funding or does it stand without provincial funding? Final question. If I can through the chair. Um, uh, I mean, I think the federal government is expecting the province and the municipality to be on the same page in terms of any offer to them. That is going to be our attempt. Um, and I'd be, uh, I, I'm not expecting that the federal government is going to uh, totally accept what the priorities are of the city and ignore the province. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Councillor Cressy, and uh, Councillor Carroll's next, and then Councillor Perks. Oh, uh, my questions are brief. Uh, uh, the, the scene keeps changing, so I probably will have questions <laughs> at Council. But one thing I did want to know, because I think you have, uh, um, you're, you're hoping to get direction on the, the supplementary item uh, 1A that has some uh, confidential uh, um, direction that it's asking for. Um, is all of that? Uh, still uh, uh, timely and necessary today, uh, given the ever-changing plan of the province? Would, would that item need to be considered at this juncture? I, I, again, through the, uh, the chair, I mean, our goal was to give you a very clear understanding of all the projects that are in various stages of planning, design, and construction. Um, our recommendation, I think, is clear in the report, is to continue moving forward with them, notwithstanding that we know we're going to hear an announcement in a couple of days. So I don't think what we're doing is premature. We'll see what the province has to offer. Uh, we'll comment on it on at council and, uh, and seek further direction there. Right. That was going to be my next question. If, if it changed, we would have council to have the seconds over thought. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Correct. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Councillor Perks. Thank you. Uh, to the city manager, so reading through this report, when you get through the front materials, you get to the comment section on page 19, and this is the section that sort of provides the rationale for the recommendations. It's broken up into three pieces, pr setting priorities, priority projects, and a second section, which is just the highlights of key transit projects, just narrative on each of them, and the third is the next steps. Yeah. Looking at the priority projects piece, uh, the one place where you actually give us advice other than council decided something before is uh, highlighting the DRL and the, uh, and the Bluer Young station work as an urgent priority because if we don't do that, the rest of the network falls apart. Have I understood that correctly? Um, through the chair, uh, I probably wouldn't characterize it exactly like that. I would characterize it as we have a congestion problem that's present today which translates into health and safety issues and from a transportation standpoint, generally speaking, that's what you try to address first before you expand the network. But it does give a rationale for why those two need to be the first priority. That's correct. Okay. Turning now to the, the, uh, the rest of the report, what I can't find is any rationale from a transportation planning point of view from any of the eight original criteria that we used in, in selecting priorities uh, for why, oh, I don't know, the uh, Eglinton East is more important than Waterfront West or Scarborough Subway is more important than Eglinton West. I, I, I see no uh, transportation or land use planning or financial impact or ridership per dollar uh, rationale for why any of those seven projects should be advanced over the other. Am I reading that correctly? So if I can through the chair, I think in, actually in your opening comment uh, before the question to me, you had made the, you know, the remark about council's uh, previous commitment. So uh, I think uh, implicitly, maybe explicitly, the reason why you see the other two projects favored within the PTIF funding is because council has 
uh, in previous decisions, and I think it's outlined well on page 8 of 30. Uh, it indicates that, you know, 660 uh, million uh, uh, previous approved by Council in October 20, uh, 2013 would be uh, allocated to Line 2 East Extension, so and, and then and so then if I'm taking your point, you're saying that it's right. not that we've been given any rationale, it's that Council told you that's what to put first. We generally follow first. Council's direction. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, so maybe so more than generally, but you know. <laughs> fair enough. But but it's because of a council direction, not because of analysis that you've provided to us about why one line is better than the other. That's a fair summary of what you just said. Uh, through the chair, I believe that's fair. Okay, very good. Um, uh, the <clears throat> process we have for making decisions about transit projects is the stage gate process. And we set that up so we didn't make a decision with limited information that led to us being trapped into building something that later on we found know. out was technically impossible or too costly or whatever. I think through the chair in principle, that's that's the benefit of a stage gate program. Right. So... Uh, uh, no, that was the final question. Oh, I had... Well, no, I, I said final question, and it's three and a half minutes. I just wanted to know, like, did we ever say you should ignore the stage gate process? You just squeezed that in, but uh, go ahead and please answer it, Mr. City we Manager. we ever tell you to ignore the stage gate You remember that now, Councilor Not Perkins. that I'm aware through the mayor, no. Okay. You just drew your account down a tiny little bit, but that's okay. You're very kind, Mr. Mayor. I know you're right. <laughs> All right, uh, Councilor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. With respect to the Scarborough extension, um, subway extension, with um, as, uh, as, as noted, we have heard about escalating and ballooning costs. Um, and uh, I'm just curious to know at what point in time will we have the, the full and final figures? So if I can through the chair, I'll start and then Gary will, I'm sure, uh, clarify what I'm saying. So, um, so I, I don't know if I characterize it as escalating and ballooning costs. I think there's, as, as we just comment on there's a sta stage gate process so it helps us to refine costs based on more exact more detailed information so I think Gary can probably land this and answer it even more clearly than I just provided the cost we'll put forward on Scarborough is based on a 30 percent design and then we've actually used the ACE recommendations for putting the estimate together so we've pulled the base cost together we've done uh, uh, we've looked at both risk on the both a project risk and a schedule risk, and we've pulled that together. That was done internally. We've actually went out to an external commercial, commercial consultancy of, of international reputation. They have verified that estimate as a reasonable estimate for this project. So we believe at this point in time, we have a very robust estimate and schedule for the Scarborough line. And when will we know the, um, the, the final numbers? When the project's finished is the only time you get, get the so final this, number. At, at this stage, when will we get the, the most updated numbers where we can actually see it in a report, clearly itemized? That is, it's, in the, it's in the council report. Those are the, the numbers that we have got just and, now. And, and those, are the, those are the verified numbers? You'll be able to stand by that? Yes, we will. We, we won't necessarily be expecting further balloons or, or escalations because you're getting to a certain level of detail refinement. Is that correct? We don't anticipate the cost to go up at this point in time based on the estimate we've pulled together. It is a very detailed estimate we have pulled together. So, the, so there will not be any additional um, expected rise in cost based on what you have presented us so far? I can't promise you that because uh, there's, there's influences that's out with our control because if you actually look at the market just now, the market, when we go out to the market, with the tender, they'll come back and they'll hopefully verify those costs we've put out. If for some reason the market can't accommodate it and the project goes out, then there'd be a further schedule risk analysis you'd have to add to those costs. And so, and, and so with respect to, so thank you, um, with respect to Bloor and Young capacity and the conversation of, with the province about possibly extending it north as opposed to addressing what's happening in sort of downstream, um, are there any indications from the province uh, about how are they going to accommodate additional ridership coming from up north if we don't deal with the Bloor Young congestion? Final question. Thank you. Certainly, that's our through the through the chair. I mean, that's that's been uh, some of the conversation at the table. I mean, we're 
We believe that the first principles we need to be addressing are the capacity uh, shortfall that we have right now before any other additional uh, uh, traffic is added to the system. So, um, but again, I think we'll, we know from their letter that they're interested in the four projects they identified. Uh, we'll see, I guess, on Thursday exactly where all that stands in some, hopefully, some more detail. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. And my apologies that I haven't been here for the uh, presentation. I've been watching when I could on the closed circuit. Um, could we talk about the, the costed number for the Scarborough subway extension? Does that include the construction and financing mm -hmm. costs? This came up in the debate years ago now. I'm just, I'm just wondering, are we talking an all-in number, or are there other other pieces we haven't added yet? Through the Mayor, that's an all-up number. Uh, previously, there was a, a potential in March 2017, the Council Directors, to do work with IO to do a DBF, Design Build Finance. We couldn't engage IO at that time. Well, that was the finance element. We're actually doing a design bid and build just now, and there's no finance costs associated with that. And so that number includes vehicles, it includes uh, maintenance facilities, it includes everything that we'll need to, 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 to operate and manage the system as proposed? It, uh, through the chair, that actually includes the vehicles, uh, and we are actually using the existing maintenance facilities. So my understanding was we, we had actually anticipated requiring new maintenance facilities. Why aren't they required anymore? Not for this project. But for then for the Young Street uh, advancement of our uh, automated trains, did that require a new facility? When you actually add the Young, the young extension on, we're actually working just now looking at having a northern uh, maintenance facilities as part of that project so and the Line 1 capacity project. What, what, about, what about before the extension north? Are we able to move ahead with the Young One capacity advancement without a new storage facility? Uh, through you, Mayor. Um, right now, the TTC is um, preparing a report to go to the board regarding Line One capacity needs through 2031. We know that we need additional vehicles beyond 2026 and 2028 in the requirement for a maintenance facility for 2031, should we go north okay. on line one. Um, on the uh, Scarborough subway extension, is it true that you, we're not planning on going the route of an automated train control system on the extension? At this point in time, that's correct. It will be the existing signaling system will be used. What we've actually allowed for within the estimate is enabling costs to do the ATC upgrade when it comes along. So why wouldn't we build it in and kind of future-proof that, that line. Is there a reason why we shouldn't? Funding. And how much, how much would it cost? I can't answer that question for you. I don't have the level. What's level the order of, of magnitude? Uh, through you, Mayor. Um, the ATC on line two was in the three to $500 million range in the last estimate, and it does need to be refined. On line two, and that, but that's for the full line. That right? would be for the full line, and the intent at the time of the TTC was for new vehicles to be incorporated with uh, the implementation of ATC, and that's all been identified in the capital investment plan that was presented in January. That, that was your final question? Okay, yes, thank you. And in anticipation of the motion with you wanting to put ATC in there on this very fine project that uh, we're proceeding with, uh, I apologize for the editorial comment. Uh, Councillor Fletcher was next. Thank you. Just a number of quick questions, and I hope some quick answers. I'd indicate that you'll be starting on a business case for the relief line north shortly. Was there a business case for the relief line south that you can give me? Through the uh, through the chair, yes, we uh, are working with Metrolinx on a on a relief line north business case, and we did do one on the relief line south that we will send to you. Thank you. Uh, what were the stations that the city was going to fund under Smart Track? Through the speaker, the smart track stations that were included are Finch, Lawrence, Gerard Carlaw, uh, East Harbor, um, uh, Liberty Village, and St. Clair. And the just under the new procurement for Metrolinx, 
they will be having the private sector build others. Are we still anticipated we will be building those stations that we said we would build, but within the new procurement rules for Metrolinx? So through the speaker, we still have a mandate from council to advance those. We are waiting for some uh, feedback or response from the provincial government about the agreement in principle related to Smart Track, but we will be advancing those stations. Thank you. Gerard Carlaw has always been showed as an interchange station between the relief line and Smart Track, and that's been now taken off one of the documents. Is there a reason for that? So Are you rethinking that? So th through the, the, the chair, that would have been, uh, would have been an error. That That's was an, an oversight. Error. Okay. However, there are... Uh, Thank you. It's an error. It will be an interchange station. As currently envisioned, with two lines going through there, there would be an interchange. Thank you. Um, in Michael Lindsay's letter, he spoke about alternative way to build finance and build the relief line. Uh, outside of what he called the outdated out te outdated technology from line two. Could somebody please explain to me what the alternative is for the relief line that's being advanced by the provincial government? Through the chair, we don't know. We have no idea, and they've not been clear that it's a, a type of tunneling, type of train, type of financing, type of controls. Would we simply assume that we have to run the same type of train, that those are going to not, they, those will be interchangeable trains? They're, line two to the relief line? Yes? No? Could the relief line run with trains that weren't the same as the ones on line two, or the same system? Efe efficiently, let me put it like that. I'm sure it could run. Sorry, can't Sorry, you? under our current design for the relief line, we'll be using the existing technology and trains that we have just now. But you did see the letter yes, we did. from the Michael Lindsay yeah. saying that it wouldn't be built like line two or unclear. Have there been no further discussions or questions? Has no one sent a letter saying, what the heck do you mean by that? Uh, through the chair, of course, we've asked and we've not received anything specific from mm -hmm. him. So I, I can't comment on technology they have in mind. I can't comment on alignment. There's, there's a lot of questions that uh, have been asked, but we're, I expect we'll be getting answers shortly. Could we see that, a copy the of the question, the, question. The, the letters? Uh, that Councillor, you... that was the final question. It's a three minute. Uh, yes, uh, I heard. Yeah, pardon me? I heard. Yeah, uh, I'll just tell you, it's been raised at the highest levels and we have no other information other than what the staff told you. So in terms of what the technology is, I guess we'll all learn that tomorrow. I'd just like to see the questions that we asked Mr. Mayor. Yeah. on that letter, if that's possible to get that. That was my next Well, we question. don't have any answers. I mean, No, no, the questions that we've asked to have answered, that oh, would I see. helpful. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, are there any other members of council that are with us here from not on the executive committee who would like to ask questions? Um, all right. Before we move to questions from the committee, I'd like to see if the committee would concur in a modest change in uh, uh, agenda for a moment. There's a gentleman uh, who is slated to depute on the King Street matter who's a wheel trans patron and who has a wheel trans booking to go back and I just thought it would be appropriate that we would hear his deputation uh, moved by Councillor Thompson all those in favor opposed carried so if, if you thank you for excusing us for a moment and Mr. A I believe it's Mr. Adam Cahoon uh, if you can come forward and we'll hear your deputation on uh, King Street so that it's on the record There's just a place, I think, Mr. Cahoon, over, I believe, over there, where there's a microphone that'll be more accessible to you, and uh, just on the far end of the table. Or, or if you can get into that one there, that's fine, but we just... Yes, sure. So you're most welcome here, and you're going to depute on the next item, which is the King Street uh, Transit item. Yes. Good. Thank you for being here. Okay. I'm Adam Cahoon. I live near the... Um, um, Front and Cherry, so I live down where that new King Street does the go to the distillery loop, and I am also a member of TTC Riders and Walk Toronto, so I've been on the steering committee of the King Street pilot since the beginning. There are um, three key things that I want to speak to you about 
quickly today. So first of all is I'm in a power wheelchair for on street boarding of street cars. The ramp is very steep. It is easy to board the streetcar at a loop where there are high platforms because those ramps, like the ramps on buses, aren't meant for off street loading. They're meant for loading on a high, on a sidewalk or higher type platform and are more like a drawbridge. So I'm encouraging at at least three or four stops through the pilot that there be, that they look at making accessible bump outs so that I can do, uh, so that it is easy to get off and on the streetcar. The second, um, the second thing that um, I am concerned about is the fact that a lot of the signals where there is the advanced turn for car have not been set up with the audible signals yet. And some of them have slowly started to be done now that the freeze on any changes are done. But I encourage through the areas where there aren't a lot of residential because it is a different set up for the blind that you actually look at um, making the, um, the audible signals autom automatic. Uh, and also, as a pedestrian user, I also want to encourage that you actually make the, uh, look at what other initiatives can be used to give pedestrians priority because if they're getting off and on the streetcar in that area, they obviously are gonna become pedestrian. So final thing, very quickly, is at the corner of King and Parliament, because that is a stop that everybody uses when they realize they've gotten on the wrong 504, uh, uh, that is already an, a narrow, a narrow um, part of the sidewalk. And that is, it's still technically part of the pilot area. It doesn't have the transit priority. But that is the busiest stop that I've seen that we are constrained to the sidewalk. One time I was almost pushed off onto the road. Luckily, luckily a few neighbors were able to catch my chair before. Uh, and I am asking, and this is why I needed to talk to you guys and not wait to the TTC. I would like you, because that property where the horse dealership and the state balls it already has one of those wonderful blue and white signs. Uh, but I was wondering if there could be anything, even if you have to expropriate two parking spots from the Porsche dealership parking lot uh, to actually make that stop a little wider so it can deal with the extra capacity because that stop is constantly fairly full. Thank you. Mr. Cahoon, thank you. And there may be a question or two, but I will just tell you that uh, you have the CEO of the TTC here, uh, and so I'm sure he was paying close attention to all the points that you made, and uh, we'll undertake to make sure we get back to you uh, with, with respect to those points, just because they're all things that relate to the uh, well-being of the what was called the pilot project going forward. Are there questions of the deputy, Councillor Cressy? Adam, thank you for being here. I just, just want to make sure I understand the three points correctly. So your recommendation as part of making it permanent is to improve it with uh, audible signaling as part of the permanent installation of the entry, the, um, the uh, streetcar stops to have ramps that are safer, uh, and to look at this safety related to the King and Parliament stop. Those were the three, those as part of making it permanent, we need to make those three pieces even better. Make the main, the main thing I need, uh, I am personally demanding that was definitely not 
any part of the report was that King Parliament thought you guys really need to look at, and I hope, yeah, great Kristen, you're here. You actually work with the, uh, the Porsche dealership and actually see if they'd be willing to give up th those give up a parking spot or two just to make it a little wider. Other people can sneak between the fence and the bus shelter. I just can't. And that's how other people are getting around that little spot where I can't do that. So I suffer when I go up on that thing. I got it. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you very much, Councillor Cressy. And uh, any other questions for the deputy? Well, thank you very much for making the effort to come, and uh, we're glad we were able to hear it. It was very important and we should I'm hear I'm going to go home and watch the rest of it on my YouTube. If you wish to punish yourself that way, sir, then you <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Try to enjoy the afternoon. Uh, okay. Uh, so if we can now revert back to uh, questions of staff on uh, item uh, EX 4.1, uh, and we were, I think we had uh, had all the questions that were forthcoming from our uh, members that were not uh, uh, members of the Executive Committee, so it's time to move to the Executive Committee and who has questions uh, on this report. Councillor Thompson. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, and I realize it's three minutes for questioning. Right? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure I'm really clear on this. There's been a number of questions asked about the cost of the um, Scarborough, the Bluer Danforth expansion into Scarborough. And the questions were around whether or not these were final costs. And I believe the answers were no, they were not. Is that correct? At this point in time, that's a stage gate three estimate, right. and a class three estimate. We believe that's a robust estimate, and that's been verified by a third party. Right, but this is consistent with uh, part of the process in terms of building transit. The costs at this point are never final. Is that correct? Through the chair, the costs are never final till you actually finish so, the project. Till you've done the job, yeah. right? So I, I guess I wanted to understand then: um, would that then be the same for the DRL? Are those costs final in this uh, report? The cost that we actually have in the, for the relief line south is a class five estimate. A class right. five estimate is not sufficient for budgeting purposes. You've actually got to get to a class three estimate for budgeting Before purposes. Before you can get there, because I was going to ask yes. you what does class five actually mean. Yeah. So all of the questions, and it's nice to know with respect to financial information, that all of the questions about the Scarborough subway has been defined by some of my colleagues. It's very clear that you don't have those final costs, and those costs could very much be larger than what is we are aware as in terms of some of the costs that's been put in place, right? Because, I mean, initially we start with 3.6, we've heard it's 3.9, and that could escalate. Is that correct? Yes, but that, that's back in history, but that's why you do a class three estimate for right. budgetary purposes. You, you take the design, we have taken the design to 30%. At 30%, you can put a robust estimate together, and we're confident the estimate that we have put forward will be, ma will be managed and met for this project. Fair enough. I, I think there's maybe just one more uh, question more that I can ask before we get to three minutes. Um, and this is through you, Mr. Mayor, to the City Manager. Mr. City Manager, we've heard Councillor Fletcher ask about the questions regarding the letter from uh, the, the province as such to you and the group. Um, in, in those letters and in some of the communications, they talk about alternative uh, methods of financing that they're looking at. And while I understand you can't answer that question because it's not your position, I'm just wondering, are there positions that we've looked at at alternate uh, financial models that could actually assist us with respect to our efforts to actually build transit? Um, through the chair, the, um, uh, again, I, I guess I, at the risk of being a bit of a broken record, we, we don't really know enough about the models that they're contemplating or the yeah, just, Mr. Chairman, just, I, I'm not asking about their model. I'm asking, okay. are there methods that we're looking at in terms of alternative financial model that we think that perhaps could be utilized? They're suggesting what they want to do. Right. I'm just wondering, are there any other alternatives that we're looking at 
as opposed to simply um, monies from the tax base as such and or contributions from the provincial or federal government? P3s, for example. Uh, I don't think we're explicitly looking at P3s. I mean, we are, um, the, the range, I, I mean, I'd have to defer to staff in terms of the range of models that have been considered. Um, Sorry, I would have to defer to staff as to the range of models that we've considered. I don't know, Joe, if you wish to weigh in. Uh, through the speaker, we, uh, before we procure any project of this magnitude, we undertake a procurement options analysis, which includes things like pro procurements such as a design build finance, which is typically the I.O. model. We've done that, in fact, for the Scarborough subway extension. And it's uh, as a result of that review, the procurement option that's before you is a design bid build. But we do undertake that due diligence to look at different financing options for the city. All right, that was the final question. Thanks, Councillor Thompson. Deputy Mayor Thompson, Councillor Ainsley to ask questions. Sorry. Yeah, you were next, uh, yes. Uh, I'm through you to uh, Mike Logan that's been looking after the Eglinton East LRT uh, consultation process. Mr. Logan, could you explain to me if I moved a motion today to do away with the phase one and do everything in one sh one phase up to Malvern for the Eglinton East LRT, what would be the biggest risk? Would it be the tie-in with the Shepherd LRT? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, Councillor, we've uh, outlined in our attachment uh, on the Eglinton East LRT uh, that we do believe there's some risk uh, in tying the Eglinton East LRT to the Shepherd uh, project. Uh, just risk around timing and, and cost sharing uh, arrangements uh, with respect to that project. Because at this at this point, the Shepherd East LRTs, even though it's been approved by council that we tie the two together, there's the, my understanding is that we don't know the timing on the Shepherd East LRT. It's I believe it's in the report. It's even behind the Finch LRT for construction. Correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I believe that's correct. Okay, and then um, some of the things that we looked at over the consultation post around the Eglinton East LRT in the first phase, um, the volume, 7,400 people, there's parts of it that we would actually, we're considering running the LRT in buses in conjunction on Eglinton, correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we're not at this point recommending uh, bus service. We're not re making any recommendations about buses. However, our travel demand modeling has, uh, has uh, um, indicates that there would be uh, very strong ridership in the order of 7,400 um, should, uh, should the service be available to people in that corridor. Okay. And then um, for the TTC staff, um, my understanding Malvern residents, the majority of Malvern residents um, travel west and not not south. Is that correct? Through the chair, correct. Uh, the, the network of bus routes today in the Malvern community is largely oriented towards Scarborough Centre Station. Okay, and I know a, a number of deputants have come in this morning. They have concerns about getting um, from the eastern part of Malvern down to the UTSC campus. Um, the bus, the buses that cover that route today. Are, are there capacity issues with them? Through the chair, uh, we have many bus routes which are close to being full. We try very hard to ensure that our ridership is kept on all routes uh, at or below our, our board approved crowding standards. Uh, also in the future, as part of the bus route changes for a potential line five extension to U of T Scarborough, we are looking at the potential of a direct bus service along Shepherd and then down to the university. Okay, and in terms of the, maybe this is a question back to Mr. Logan, um, what's the time lag, time lag be for between just doing phase one and if we did the full phase to Malvern? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I Final question. don't believe that, um, I, I'm not sure I understand your question, Councillor. Uh, uh, would it take more time? Is that your question to? Uh, I'm trying to, so if we, I understand the timeline at looking at doing phase one just to UTSC. If we were to change it today and do it right to Malvern in one phase, what would that do to the timeline? Uh, I think that um, it would be premature to speculate on that, as I described, um, I think it's tied to the Shepherd East LRT project, and that would be the, the greatest determinant of the, of the timeline for delivery of the project. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mayor Tory. Thank Thanks. you for your... Uh, uh, Councillor Nunziata. Yes, thank you. Um, 
So on page 7 of 30, I just wanted to just ask a couple of questions on the Eglinton West. Um, in rec recommendation 11, um, it mentions that uh, report back to the executive committee once Metrolinx and the GTAA have completed the planning. And then recommendation 12 is that you'll be reporting back on the, in 2020, first quarter 2020, on the traffic uh, from transportation on uh, the, the existing uh, traffic and future traffic. So can you tell me, are those two, 11 and 12, the timing of the, of the, the two reports be coming forward at the same time? Through the, like how uh, the is mayor. that because you have to coordinate those two reports through through the mayor uh, the uh, these are different issues so as part of our work we did a significant traffic analysis in the Eglinton corridor and identified that there are a number of issues already at play there related to the highway ramps and capacity along the 401 in particular but other issues too that are forcing more people to drive along Eglinton and causing some of the traffic issues. What we want to do is work with transportation services and the and MTO to look at solutions for those traffic issues. Regardless of, of an LRT, there are traffic uh, right. solutions that are required in that area. Right. And is that part of the recommendations that come forward from the working, uh, the working group committee that uh, you've been meeting with? Uh, the working group was looking, the community working group was looking at options for the LRT and certainly traffic considerations were a part of that analysis, but this was detailed traffic analysis that we undertook, um, particularly at the Martin Grove and Eglinton in intersection with, uh, with traffic um, engineers mm -hmm. uh, to, to see what solutions there may be. Okay, thank you. Um... So the main, um, I know that I did ask the question at council and I got a response for it. So the maintenance facility for Eglinton, it would be at the um, Eglinton and Black Creek where the former Kodak. Uh, Through the, the mayor, yes, that is correct. And there is capacity to uh, expand within that maintenance and storage facility to serve Eglinton West without impacting the, uh, the development parcels that you were uh, asking about, Councillor. And the development parcels will proceed once the line opens. Th they would still proceed, line. yes. Yeah. Okay, um, question to the city manager um, about smart tracks. So some of these smart track stations, and in particular, I want to ask about mine in St. Clair, there's, uh, there's, there's opportunities for potential development in those areas, um, big, uh, you know, um, because there's a lot of vacant land. Um, so is there a possibility to work with some of the, um, in partnership with some of the potential development uh, that's upcoming in the area? Uh, if I can, through the, uh, the chair, I mean, that certainly is uh, Metrolinx's practice. And so as you point out, there is uh, an ample amount of vacant land and, and now underutilized land that would, uh, um, you know, would be good candidates for that kind of development, especially if we're going to be building a station there. Thank you, Councillor Nunziata. Are there other, uh, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Barlow? Thank you. Um, with regard to the PITIF funding, so are we applying directly to the federal government or do we have to go through the province? Uh, through the mayor, the expectation is that the province and the municipality would work together to put an application in? Essentially. <laughs> okay. Although if I can, I, I think through the chair, I, you know, we are, we are, as you well know, we're not created equal. I think the, uh, uh, there isn't a direct line between the federal government and ourselves in terms of how this money gets allocated. So um, we will be sitting down with the province and, and working through. I think our priorities are clear and they've indicated their preferences. So we'll see what it is that we can hopefully work together to make you know, as much of a unified uh, uh, position, uh, put that forward to the federal government. Okay. Um, and the PITIF 2, basically, I'm sure that um, the modeling that you used is based on having the construction and approval of the projects that were done with the funds for the phase one, correct? Uh, again, phase one was really about state of good repair. That was the focus. So that 800 and I believe 54 million dollars uh, was was earmarked towards that that kind of outcome. Um, so what we're talking about with PEEP tip two is expansion. Um, so um, that's 
that's obviously the difference between the two uh, programs. Okay. Um, I, I want to touch a little bit of, uh, on the um, Bloor line, on the uh, line two, and follow up on the questions from, um, I think it was Councillor Layton. Uh, so the automatic train control, um, when will we be at capacity on this line? On line two, we are at a, a lower crowding level than today on line one, although we are catching up uh, closely. And by the late 2020s, we believe that we would need additional trains to run all the service. So late 2020s. And when have we started the, AT, the automatic train control implementation in line one? Uh, the ATC project, the automatic train control system project on line one, was started as a project in 2007. 2007, and we're in 2019. So we should start the line two, if if we use the same rhythm of. And how? What's the capacity that can add on line two? Uh, the ca capacity that can be added by automatic train control is, is dependent on a number of factors, including the size of the trains. Average. However, on average, we're adding up to about 20% capacity in line one, with the addition of the new signal system and also the new trains. Okay, and and that I is take when you say late 2020s. That is if all these projects that we're asking for funding get implemented. Because if not, the pressure might be even higher on line two. Uh, correct. Am I assuming that? Chair, correct. Would that be correct? Uh, correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Deputy Marvalo. Uh, now um, I think we're we're we'll see if there's anybody else from the committee that wishes to ask questions about the report. Okay, well, if there is no one, then I think we can uh, thank uh, the staff very much for their answers, and we can then uh, adjourn for lunch, and we will have speeches uh, from those wishing to speak after we come back at lunch at 1.30. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.